Hi, gang. Bob Bolving here to welcome you to a brand new series on The Mystery Project. In the Blood is the story of Marty Carlin, a police detective in Toronto, who finds himself driven by circumstance to abandon his career and return to his roots in Halifax. And how this happens is laid out tragically in our opening installment, Self-Contained by Paul Ledoux. Starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, Episode 1 of In the Blood. Where to start? Toronto. Five days ago. 5.10 a.m. Me and my partner, Brian Cooper, were parked out back of an East End warehouse. Our car jammed in the darkest corner we could find. We were sitting in an empty lot, watching a particular shipping container, and waiting for a man called... Stanko Velchev. Even his name sounds crooked. Yeah. Old Stinko is the kind of refugee that reform party flax salivate over. I think they've got a point. When a low-life fence can get refugee status, something is definitely wrong. Hey, he's from Bulgaria, and he got in while the Cold War was still hot. Guess you're too young to remember how much immigration loved or read on the run. Yeah. What was it like back then, Grandpa? <laughs> You're such a hard-nosed doofus. Hey, I'm the youngest detective on the Metro Toronto Police Force. I gotta be hard-nosed. Especially when riding with a senior officer. You knock it off. Marty, that's your sixth can. It's just Coke, Brian, and I'm thirsty. Thirsty? You could be a hydroponic garden. And I'm so sick of looking at that container, I could puke. Look on the bright side, Brian. The container company said they'd pick up by six. If Stinko is going to load the damn thing, he's got to do it soon. I got a whiz. Again? We only rent it, Brian. Yell if you need me. I'll be out back at the dumpster. I felt weird. To tell you the truth, I've been feeling weird for days. Like my body was out of proportion with the world around me. And my concentration... Not up to par. I kept on meaning to go to the doctor, but I knew what he'd say. Lose 20 pounds. I didn't want the obvious on a medical report to the department. I was 46, and I knew they were already sizing me up for a desk. And some days, I felt like I was ready. I was finishing up on the far side of the dumpster when... Bell chat. Right on time. And I could hear a little voice somewhere saying... Sit on the but everything was moving slow. So slow. Look around. Oh, for God's sake, Stan. It's the middle of the night. There's no one here. Maybe. But if anybody fanning around, I want to know about it. They hadn't seen me. I knew that, but something was wrong. I felt like I was swimming in molasses. This is stupid. Three years we've been. Hey! You in the car, what are you doing? It was going bad. Brian was making his move without me. I was trying to unholster my gun. I yelled, Okay, hey, hold, hold it right, right there. there. But nothing came out. Nothing. Metro police, raise your hands above your head. Brian was out of the car, gun out. He had the guy cold, but Velchev? I saw him in the shadows. Saw the glint of a gun barrel. Everything went black. I came too. I was lying beside the garbage dumpster. The container was gone. The loading dock empty. Had no clear idea what had happened. That wasn't surprising given the slice across the side of my skull. I wandered around in the daze. Then I remembered. Right. Brian, you okay? Brian! 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 So, that's it. I come too, and I can't remember anything. What'd the doctors say? Doctors? You go in with a bump on your head, first thing you know, they're taking your blood. No apparent concussion. Then why don't you remember what happened? Hey, you get hit across the head with a pipe, I bet you wouldn't remember anything either. The only clue we've got is the container. Shipped east out of Toronto on a fast freight. So, here I am. 
But you could have flown to Montreal, cracked the container, and saved the T.O. police the cost of an overpriced ticket to the Maritimes. Belchev will show in Halifax. They say you can never go home again. In the Maritimes, everybody knows coming home is inevitable. It's in the blood. Genetic. A mystical salmon run of the soul. I hate fish. And what makes you so sure he's headed here? You always loved the third degree, didn't you, McNeil? Uh, just liaison is all. That was the assignment. Liaise with the detective from T.O. So, why so sure? The container is logged, domestic destination. Last stop, Halifax. But it's headed for Bulgaria, so he's got to make a switch. But what makes you so sure it's headed for Bulgaria? I've got his M.O. down, okay? I've been on Belchav's ass for months. Three times a year, he flies to Bulgaria. He comes back, he makes a big deposit... Got it? Sure. Take it easy, Marty. I'm, I'm sorry, Danny. It, it, it's just... Yeah, yeah. Your partner, right? I heard. Brian's not in that container. I didn't say he was. I thought it through. They jumped me and knocked me out. If they shot Brian, they would have had to shoot me too. So he's got to be alive. That's the only way it makes sense. Right, Danny? Sure, that's the only way it makes sense. It's going to be okay, Marty. Sergeant Dennis McNeil. I was 12, he was 21. He caught me boosting candy out of the store on the corner of Cabot and Agricola. He sentenced me on the spot, one month of weekends at the police boys' club. End of the sentence, and I kept coming back. I never really stopped getting into trouble. But then he never gave up on me either. Anyway, when I decided to go straight, being a cop didn't seem to be a half bad idea. I kind of hoped it would make him proud. So why was I chewing his head off? Maybe because I was more worried about what was in that container than I was prepared to admit. Halifax, Nova Scotia. The port. The fog hovering over Black Rock Beach, just like I remembered. Smelling the sea, the sickly aftertaste of death caught in the back of my throat. Well, there's your container, Pierre. Yeah. Remember what it was like down here in the old days? Remember? Me and Patty? The harbor police on our tail? We could go up those train cutting cliffs like mountain goats. <laughs> right. With Patty's little brother Bruce hanging off his neck like a chimp. Regular dead end kids. <laughs> We couldn't wait to get our stevedores papers. Right. They were licensed to steal. The <laughs> fact is, the containers saved the port. Oh, yeah, right. Nothing falls off the back of a truck anymore. Well, no, I didn't say that. But the boys have had to become more creative. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, buddy, you're so dumb you don't know if your ass was punched aboard. That's Freddy Ferret. Yeah. I would have given you any money, he'd be dead by now. Yeah, or at least in jail. But you know Freddy, tough as a boiled owl and slippery as an eel. Yeah, well, if you don't like it, Clyde, I can show you where to shove it. So now he's a crane jockey. How else can you steal a container? Why in hell don't they just fire him? Hey, his father still runs the union. <laughs> Same old town, eh? Corrupt from the bottom up. Martin... You've picked up some foul attitude towards this place? Nothing personal, eh? Marty, you got people here who care about you. You can't get more personal than that. Sorry, Denny. Damn it, the place is haunted. Every second corner reminds me of something I screwed up. Nothing good ever happened to me till I got out of here. Well, thank you very much. Four Winds Enterprises was one of those nondescript outfits you find tucked away in old warehouses down in the docks. They were marine consultants, outfitters, salvage brokers, and they bought and sold Navy surplus. Anything to turn a buck, including freight forwarding. The proprietor, E.M. Matthews, was a fireplug in an old Caldwell Brothers tweed. He was more than happy to be of assistance. So, um... You've dealt with Baltic Enterprises before? Oh, yes. They've been steady customers for, well, several years now. 
Small contracts, but very prompt in their payments, unlike most of our other Toronto clients. And they always ship through Halifax? No, according to our records, ship to Halifax. Domestic cargo only. Contents? General merchandise. Of course, given the proper paperwork, no one would ever look inside. So. Yeah, about that. I, I made a uh, request for a warrant. Yeah, it's taken care of. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we got an ETA on the train? Mm-hmm. We're looking at 2,400 hours. But you know the CNR. Right. Just one more question. How hard would it be to reroute a domestic container to a foreign destination? Well, it would double the paperwork, and then customs would want to look. It's not the way I'd do it. Right. Well, thanks. I'll need you down here when the train arrives. Oh, of course. Well, in the meantime, I hope you'll take a chance to see a bit of the province. Peggy's Cove is quite majestic this time of year. Yeah, if you don't get washed off the rocks. Yes, well, unfortunately, you can't always see the big wave coming. Residence. It's me. Hi, babe. How's it going? I'm beat. You? Fine. How's Mary doing? Her husband is missing. How do you think? Right. I'll go over again in the morning. Thanks. So how's Pat? He's jealous. Of what? You. According to him, the grunge scene in Halifax is still very hot. Yes, yeah, as if it wasn't grungy enough already. <laughs> anyway, you got a pencil? I'm at the... Uh, Wentworth Suites, 902-422-0344. Okay? Got it. I thought you were going to call my father. I know, but um, I'm not going to have any time for family visits. He'll have my hide if he finds out you didn't stay with them. I'll keep a low profile. Right. I mean it. Nobody knows I'm here. And, uh... Hang on, somebody's at the door. Yeah, coming. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? How are you, you old Hyderstone hillbilly? Bruce? Put her there, Marty. Damn, it's good to see you. I heard you were in town, so I called up Denny. Yeah, uh, so, uh, come in. I'm on the phone to my wife. Hi, Sharon. Who's that? It's Bruce. Patty's brother. No one knows I'm here, huh? <laughs> okay, all right. I better go. <laughs> yeah, but before you go, Dr. Phillips left a message on the machine. He got the test results and said you should phone him first thing tomorrow. Phillips? Sure, I'll pencil them in. You do it, Marty. I know you and doctors. Okay, okay, I promise. Tell Pat if he bashes up the car while I'm away. <laughs> Pat is on the skateboard till you get home. <laughs> I love you, babe. Yeah, same here. I'll check in tomorrow. I love you. So, Bruce, how are you? Great. You won't believe it, but later for that. I got a table booked at McLean's. We got some catching up to do. I gave Denny my cell phone number. You're covered. Want the last clock? I'd explode. Mm, me too. Okay, well, cheers. Here's to, uh, your wife. My big brother's best friend married to Senator Green's daughter. <laughs> it's a wonder the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron didn't slide into the arm. You know, six years I've run the biggest insurance firm in town, and I still can't get an invite to one of those really important South End affairs. Yeah? Well, there's a secret to that. What's that? you got to own the insurance company. <laughs> yeah, Bruce McKenzie. Yeah, he's right here. Danny. Yeah? Train will be passing by Prince's Lodge before you know it. See you, bud. Right. So, what's shaking? The freight I've been waiting for is coming in. Well, great. Hey, waiter. Yeah, can we get the check? Yes, that's the one. LX 3450D. Careful with that. It's evidence. It's a GD can, buddy. They're friggin' indestructible. Great. Uh, you got a key or something? You sure you got that warrant? When did you turn into a lawyer, Freddy? Do I know you, buddy? Warren Lifty. Colonel. Is that you? Last time I looked. Jesus. Putting on the palms, ain't you? Asked for days up there in T.O., Fred. Let's do it. Nothing. An empty tin can with ten fifty-pound lead bars strewn over the floor. And that was it. I'd been chasing smoke while my partner, Velchev, and the stolen goods were headed anywhere but Halifax. 
My company insures the whole pier, and I'm telling you, if that container seal was intact, the container was shipped empty. Then explain to me how Belchev made the contents of the storage locker full of stolen goods disappear in half an hour. Well, could be he's the Bulgarian Doug Henning. Yeah, well, the trail's gone cold. So I'm out of here first thing in the morning. Jumping the gun a bit, aren't you? You know something I don't? I know Freddy just got off shift, and I know where he'll be. When it comes to scams on the waterfront, well, he's still Freddy Ferret. Come on, Freddy. A container turns up empty, what do you think? When a container turns up empty, I don't think nothing. Yeah, usually you're too busy unloading it to think. You know so much about how things work. Why are you bothering me? Because I don't know what happened to LX3450D. Well, neither do I. Okay, Fred, cut the crap. I want something we can take home with us. Or would you prefer I send the boys from the station up to check out that garage you got on Merkle Street? There's nothing in that garage. Just some old antiques, huh? I keep them for my aunt. Look, McNeil, I swear, nobody in Halifax laid a finger on that container. Cops come in within a quarter mile of that pier, and we all know something's going on. Then how did Beltev clean it out? One container looks the same as the next, except for the ID number, painted on this side. All it takes is the right way bill, a stencil, a can of spray paint, enough time, and I don't even have to be a dry night. There were 700 other containers in that train. Which one was mine? Back at the hotel, I tried to work it through. I got nowhere. Not surprising, given how long I'd been running on nothing but dread and adrenaline. It was a lonely night. I drank about a gallon of water and went to bed more bent out of shape than a kid on a bad acid trip. Last thing I remember, I was a mess. I woke up 15 hours later in a bed, soaked with sweat. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Jeez, boy, a little late for a nap, isn't it? Oh. What time is it? Seven o'clock. I got a table at Delmonico's. Oh, God. I need to get a drink of water. Hello? Oh, hi, Sharon. It's Bruce. Bruce Mackenzie. Yeah. How are you? No, no, we've never met, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Your wife. He's right here. So, hi. Marty, you said you'd call the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I slipped my mind. Well, he phoned again, and this time we talked. What did he say? He said you've got a blood sugar count of 27.8. Hey, that's 0.8 higher than my IQ. Not funny, Marty. He says it could be a symptom of diabetes. It could be, but it's not. I've had a couple of run-ins with the flu, but I don't have diabetes. Phillips wants you to go to a doctor first thing tomorrow. Sharon, I don't have time. Martin. Okay. Okay, I'll go. Okay? Fine. So, what are you doing, anyway? Wrapping Christmas presents. I, uh, took Mary to the price club. Had to buy something. She just kept talking about what she was going to get Brian. You got anything yet? Sure. An empty container. And a theory that Belcher pulled a switch by altering the ID numbers. All I've got to work with is a printout listing 700 other containers that were on that train. If one of them is our can, I... I sure as hell don't know how I'm going to find it. Hmm, well, something must make your container different from the other 699. Right. What's inside it? But how do I figure that out? Well, if they were Christmas presents, I could send Pat down to rattle them for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a day. Rattle them, get the heft of this thing. Big box, Dad, but no weight. <laughs> Disc man, right? <laughs> Jesus. That's it. What? Compare the weight. It's right here on the freight list. Belcher's container weighed in at 2.56 tons. If there is another container with the same tonnage, here it is. CD249FD. To be held for shipment in Rotterdam. <laughs> I love you. Then you take care of yourself. See the doctor, eh? I'm on my way. Did I say I love you? Yeah. Bye. Diabetes? Sounds like the name of a band my kid would play in. We got the container. Foreign destination routed through Rotterdam. To be held there for shipment to another destination. So he's not here? Who? Velchev. 
If the container was routed direct to Rotterdam, then... Then there's no reason for Velchev to come to Halifax to make the switch. Damn it all, my brain's working like a truck stuck in the mud. What's this diabetes thing? Uh, it's nothing. It's just my, my blood sugar's up. Uh, they probably got my sample mixed up with some pastry chef. Uh, Marty, I'm in the insurance business. I eat medical statistics. One in ten Canadians is diabetic, and you've got classic symptoms. Weight problem, high blood sugar, excessive thirst, unusual sleep patterns, and then there's those erratic mood swings. Erratic mood swings? Denny told me you chewed his head off coming in from the airport. So I've got a temper. Yeah, but taking a go at McNeil? Come on. Maybe you'd better see my doctor before you start passing out in the street. Nobody blindsided me. I passed out. What? Back in Toronto, I thought... I thought one of Velchev's guys knocked me out. That's not what happened. I had some kind of diabetic attack, fell, hit my head in the dumpster, and they wouldn't have killed Brian and left me alive, that's what I thought. But they didn't even know I was there. And that means Brian's dead. Your partner? Yeah. Belchev shoots him, then they panic. What to do with the body? They're debating the problem when the truck shows up. So they get rid of the body the fastest way they can. How? The container. But your bad guy's got to know you'll be chasing it. He doesn't even know I exist. And anyway, he's pulling a switch on the numbers. If anybody goes looking for his can, what are they going to find? An empty box. So Brian gets shipped offshore in the real container. No, that won't work. Three weeks at sea, another week in Rotterdam? You couldn't hide the smell. Belchev has to deal with Brian's body before the container leaves Halifax. Marty, most of those containers? They're going out tonight. After midnight, the port was still cooking. The huge crane sliding up and down the rows of containers like some grotesque species of daddy long legs caught in the sulfurous light. A big ship alongside the dock, loading fast. The cold fog hovering over Black Rock Beach. Bruce and me watching the can I know holds my partner's body. We should have called Danny. One whiff of the cops and Velchev's history. We've been here three hours, Marty. So what? Well, maybe you got it figured wrong. No. He'll make his move before they load the container. Then right on cue, Velchev comes strolling along the row, looking like he'd worked the port his whole life. All right. Let's wait, wait. He has to open the can to tie him to the body. I squat. Focusing everything I've got into a tight little ball of rage. Felchev slowly opens the container. He leans in. A long, still moment. And then... Brian. Stanko Velchev, You're under arrest. He's got a gun. Get down. I hit Bruce hard, <gasps> driving him back behind the row of containers. It hurt. You okay? Yeah. Where is he? I don't know. I got up, slow, gasping for breath and fumbling for my gun. Then... There. He's headed for the fence. Belchev! Stop or I'll shoot! He spun, leveled his weapon, and... We both fired. Then it was like something out of Monty Python. Sixteen tons plunging from thirty feet straight down, but almost in slow mo. Belchev's... Head is starting to cock upward. It's not very clear after that. Little shards of memory. Bruce calling for help. Police cars. Denny making me sit down. Freddy pacing the dock, panicked. There was nothing I could do. I mean, I'm up there riding a the crane, and suddenly, pop, pop, bullets flying every way. I just dropped a stick and ducked. I remember how slowly the big crane hoisted the fallen container into the air. And Velchev smeared across the pavement like some kind of obscene roadkill. Dead man switch should have kicked in, but I don't know. Something that snagged, and kaboom. Never killed nobody down there before. Mark, you okay? That's Velchev. He, uh... Look at you, bud. 
He's soaking with sweat. Yeah. Martin? I returned fire, Denny. I didn't... Yeah, don't worry about any of that now, son. Come on. We gotta get you to a hospital. The next morning, I woke up to find Sharon sitting beside me, doing her best to look happy. Denny and Bruce stood in the doorway, edgy as two kids skating the first freeze on Chocolate Lake. So, how's she going? Been better. Yeah. So? So, I'm going to resign. Well, now, that's no way to play it, Barton. Back in Toronto, I'll be a desk case who got his partner killed. Pushing paper until I get sick enough to go on disability. Look, Marty, diabetes is not the end of the world. Worst comes to worst, you're going to kick ten years earlier than I do. But they're the worst ten years anyway. Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Think nothing of it. And as far as your resignation is concerned, I'm all for it. You don't know what you're talking about, Bruce. No. I have an opening for an insurance investigator. And it definitely pays better than being a cop in Toronto. Interested? Jeez, Bruce. This diabetes thing. Ah, big hairy deal. At the moment, you're a wreck. But you still saved my life. So what do you say? I'll have to talk to Sharon. Uh, would you like us to leave? That's okay, Danny. Sharon? I love the idea. Gives you a chance to get better, and uh, gets Patty out of T.O. before he ends up in jail. <laughs> Great. I mean, if, you, uh, if you're okay with it... I'm more than okay with it, Marty. This is my hometown, right? Right. <sighs> okay. Welcome home, bud. You have just heard episode one of our new series, In the Blood, entitled Self-Contained. The series is written by Paul Ledoux. Featured in the cast were Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, John Fulton as Denny McNeil, Jennifer Overton as Sharon Carlin, Jamie Bradley as Bruce McKenzie, Chris Shore as Brian, Andre Mahankoff as Velchev, Lori LaViolette as Freddie Ferret. Bruce Armstrong as E.M. Matthews, and Steve Abbas as Eddie. Casting is by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The music was created by Dave Burton. The recording engineer was Pat Martin, with sound effects by Dermot Kenny. The associate producer is Peggy Hemsworth. In the Blood is produced and directed in Halifax by Bill Howell, the executive producer of The Mystery Project. I'm Bob Bovin, thanking you for listening and inviting you back next time for Marty Carlin's second adventure on In the Blood. It's called Another Scoop. Hi, gang. Bob Bovin here for The Mystery Project with Episode 2 of In the Blood by Paul Ledoux. Marty Carlin has returned to his hometown, leaving a career as a Toronto police detective. But that experience has taught him that sometimes bad things do happen to bad people. However... That never keeps questions from being asked, sometimes with frightening results. Now, Barry Dunn stars in Another Scoop. We've been back in Halifax officially for less than a week. That's me and my wife, Sharon. My son, Pat, was finishing up his school year back in Toronto. Fifteen years with the Toronto police had gone sour with a diabetic attack and a blown stakeout. My partner ended up dead. After all that was over, I didn't feel like being a cop anymore. I took a job as an insurance investigator and I came home. You know, it's funny. The things you remember and the things you forget. Like the gossip. Nova Scotia is the kind of place where gossip is worth its weight in gold. The problem is some people don't know when to leave bad enough alone. William B. Cochran, for instance, editor extraordinaire of Scoop magazine. He was an expert in the fine art of washing other people's dirty laundry. Until the day he got caught in his own story. Where to begin? With a party. Sharon's family was ecstatic that she was back in town, a real cause for celebration. The party was large, refined, and held at the Royal Nova Scotia Yacht Squadron. Quaint little palace overlooking the northwest arm. Besides Sharon, the only friend I had in the room was my new boss, Bruce McKenzie. 
<laughs> Better believe it. Yeah. See you later. Who was that? Hillary Smith Jones. Her husband owns Sacco. All of it? Just the retail end. Oh, this is great. Never thought I'd get an invite to one of the senator's soirees. Especially through an old North Ender like me. Well, that doesn't surprise me. You're always a winner. Yeah? Then how come I'm working for you and not the other way around? <laughs> because I hustle harder than Lindros in the corners. Ha oh, Judge Keith. Are you risking Marblehead again this year? Oh, <laughs> good, good, good. Catherine and I wouldn't miss it for the world. Oh, watching him and the missus work in a room is like poetry in motion. Oh, yeah, they're pros all right. Hey, one of the biggest media conglomerate in Maritimes, 15 years in the Senate. We're talking about raw, untrammeled political power here. Just watch out you don't get swamped in his wake. Are you kidding? Hey, he's used to getting his way. And you're not the kind of guy who likes doing that. Oh. He's my father-in-law, Bruce, not my boss. Right, but keep on his good side, eh? Because the old guy can't last forever, and somebody's going to end up on a TV network. Heads up. Oh, Marty! Senator, this is, uh, Catherine Green, uh, Senator. You know Bruce McKenzie? Uh, Mrs. Green and I have never been formally introduced. A pleasure. Great party. Thank you, Bruce. Marty, what is that you're drinking? Diet Sprite. Impossible. It's your party. Waiter, champagne! No, I can't, seriously. I have to watch the calories. Now, now. The key is not counting calories, but making calories count. Luke <laughs> Pico, four ounces, 30 calories, sip. Mother, if he doesn't want a drink, he doesn't want a drink. But Sharon, he is dying for a drink. At least I would be if I were taking my first swim in this shark tank. Oh, there's Hillary. Hillary! <laughs> that woman would give Gracie Allen a run for her money. But seriously, if you'd like a decent malt, they keep something special Get on her. Get Senator. He's on the wagon, right, Sharon? He is not on the wagon. He's on a diet. <laughs> I stand corrected. Hi, I'm Margaret. My pleasure. Margaret, uh, Bruce McKenzie. Margaret, Sharon's roommate at Shill's school, right? Yes, the curse of a private school education has deeply damaged both of us, right, Senator? <laughs> yes, Margaret's one of the family. Her father, Harry, and I started out together. Best friend I ever had. Shot for shot, bottle for bottle. And as a result, I slave for CJNS to this very day. <laughs> Margaret's my right hand. I couldn't run the business without her. Thanks, Bob. Oh, look what I picked up. Another scoop. Who's on the cover? Sharon. Catherine, scoop. Not a game. Listen. A pop of overpriced champagne will be heard all up and down the arm this weekend as habitually over-refreshed Senator Green to the Guild welcomes his prodigal offspring, Sharon, back to the fold. Oh, I despise the way that man goes on about money. His values are completely... The former Hapaflax media darling returns fresh from a faltering career in Turkey Town. The big question bouncing around the birds, will a Scotch-stunned millionaire give his little snuggums an anchor spot on CJNS News or start the rusty reporter in her old job as the weather girl? Give me that. More to the point, what to do with hubby Marty, madman Martin Carlin? Rumor has it he won't be nosing up to the big trough just yet. Bruce, bad boy Mackenzie. Hey, that's me. The vicious head of the Metropolitan Insurance Group has hired friend of the family, Carlin. At last, an invitation to those south side soirees he slavers after. Ow. Let me see that. Carlin will take over as head of investigations at Metropolitan. Sad to say, Madman left his last job in Toronto's very own Keystones under a cloud. You might remember his ex partner turned up as an unregistered cargo down at the container pier. Rumor has it is on time to pass and get something to do with Carlin passing out on the job. Get out the Glen Fittick, Stunner. Sounds like fresh fodder for the endless field. Who does this crap on me? Scoop. Cock and the editor calls his vendetta satire in the great tradition of punch. That little weasel's been libeling me for months. Now careful on your blood pressure, my dear. We want you around for Christmas. I'd say we can't let him get away with that kind of slam. Unfortunately, there's always just enough fact mixed in with the nonsense to make legal action futile. Well, it's one thing to go after me. I'm a public figure. But if Cochran thinks she can hurt my little girl and her family... You've got a little problem there, too. What's that? Almost everything they said was true, including me passing out of the job. You didn't pass out because you were drinking? Which is what he implied, not what he said. Well, that's the last time that bottom feeder will print anything about either of you. I guarantee it. I think we're better off just to ignore him. Guys like Cochran are like wood tips. Once they get under your skin, they just keep burrowing. Unless you have to burn them out. I'm serious, Senator. Let it be. 
son, you just don't understand how easily I can fix this. Dad, heart. we fight our own battles, okay? Fine. I need a drink. Sorry. I just have one question. Yes, dear? Sharon, do you really want to be the weather girl again? Somehow, I survived the party without the champagne and was up bright and early for work. Hey, if you think insurance investigation is glamorous, you're kidding yourself. I spent the morning on the computer comparing claim patterns for broken car windshields and was going over the results with Bruce when... Metro Insurance. Claims investigation. Carlin speaking. Marty? Oh, hi, Sharon. Mother is frantic. What's the matter? It's Dad. He just got a call from the editor of Scoop. What about? Oh, he wouldn't say. Just swore he was going to get the guy and stormed out of the house. She's worried he's going to do something stupid, Marty. Scoop is just down the street from you, so... I'm on my way. According to Bruce, everybody in Halifax read Scoop. But you'd hardly know it from the address he gave me. The magazine was run out of a couple of crummy rooms on the sixth floor of the Atlantic Building, a World War II relic on Barrington Street that reeked of collection agencies and failed mail-order catalogs. I found the office and rang a security buzzer. The door was opened by a bald-headed potato in a blinding white shirt wearing, I kid you not, a green plastic visor. Uh, Bill Cochran? William I despise the local tradition of reducing every human being to a quaint diminutive. William, then, is that you? That depends. Are you armed? You want to frisk me? I hardly think it will be necessary. W.E. Cochrane at your service. What can I do for you? Well, actually, I'm looking for Senator Green. I was told that he might uh, be... He might be indeed. But who might you be? Marty Carlin. Pure serendipity. Forgive the security measures. Come right in. Senator? Fresh father? From what Sharon had said, I expected to walk into a Donnybrook. Instead, I found the senator calmly standing beside a bookcase, admiring this crudely carved wooden monkey. Senator, you like my monkey? It's grotesque. Thank you. A totemistic affectation, perhaps, but it serves as a reminder that here at Scoop, we are indeed prepared to see, hear, and speak evil. Monkey see, monkey do. Where were we? Oh, yes. The strange case of Martin Curley. What's this all about, Senator? I'm not quite sure. Voila. You've been photo-digitized, Carlin. You were so much more hirsute in your youth. Where in hell did you get that? The crustacean, October the 20th, 1970. Horror, little hippie rag, but it had its moments. You've led quite a colorful life, Mr. Carlin. Hey, it was the end of the 60s. Everybody lived colorful lives. Perhaps. But I'm sure the senator didn't have his best friend shot to death by a black panther. Did you, senator? Ignore him, Marty. That's ancient history. It was until you married the senator's daughter, and I got the facts. But you got the facts wrong. Billy was never a panther. No, 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 not the facts. The facts. F-A-X. We print the facts. What? See that old fax machine there? I call him Snoop. He still uses that horrid, slick paper on the roll, but his sister Poop, well, she's built right into my computer, fast as lightning. Now, have you ever told the senator about this firebomb? I know all about it. I see. Had him checked out, did you? I <laughs> married my daughter. You can't honestly think I hadn't. You checked me out? That was years ago, Marty. Still, Senator admits knowledge of firebombing has a certain ring. Another scoop. I didn't firebomb anybody. Well, you weren't charged. No doubt your mentor, Sergeant McNeil, has something to do with that cover-up. Any comment, Senator? Just one. You print that slander and I'll bury you. Metaphorically or physically? Take your pick. I'm all a tremble. Look, Senator, this is my business, not yours. Smarten up, Marty. There's only one way to deal with cockroaches like this. Squash them. Look, you want to play it that way, Senator? Do it on your own time, not mine, right? Senator and son-in-law in scoop squabble. Oh, delicious. Shut up, Cochran. Martin, I've had just about enough of your boneheaded North End pride. This isn't about you. It's about my family. And I'm not going to let this clown print another word about my little girl. She's not your little girl. She's 40 years old, and she's my wife. Print it all, Cochran. To hell with the both of you. Jesus. Diabetes doesn't skip lunch. 
Not that I needed a hypoglycemic attack to make me glow, but it helped. I barely made it to the smoke shop on the main floor. Two chocolate bars and a bottle of OJ later, I came around. I felt like a limp dishware, and I wasn't quite sure what had just gone down. I called Sharon and told her all about it. Then drove to Windsor to talk to those auto repair guys with the overinflated sense of what a windshield is really worth. At least there was something I could relate to. I got home about eight, dead tired, and still angry. He meant well. That's not the point. I won't let him run my life. But he's an old man and he's used to getting his way. So I've heard. I'm never going to fit in down here, Sharon. I don't even want to. It was a mistake to come back. I'll get it. Danny? Sorry I'm coming so late, Mrs. Oh, that's okay. Uh, come on in. You look like you could use a drink. Yeah, I guess I could. Rum and Coke? Rum and Coke. Forget the Coke. So, you want to talk about it? Did it show that much? Fifteen years married to a cop, I recognized the symptoms. What happened? Ah, uh, it's nothing you'd want to know about. Thanks. I spent five years covering crime in T.O., Denny. Not much creeps me out. Eh, someone got killed is all. Cochran, the editor guy. Poor bastard. Excuse my language. He had his head bashed in with a wooden monkey. William Cochran? Scoop? God, I was down there this afternoon. Yeah, the guy in the smoke shop described you. Round four? Yeah. That why you're here? Was anybody else around? Yeah, the senator. But I was the one that got up tight. Cochran was going to run the story about Patty. Huh. Didn't take long for him to get on to that, did it? Apparently somebody faxed it in, so he called the senator. Did you leave them there together? Yes, you aren't suggesting that my father... It's just procedure, missus. Who had motivation? The suspect list will be as long as your arm. Last week, Cochrane even slagged the archbishop. <laughs> True. But uh, killing somebody who claims you're rigging a bingo game, that's just not the Catholic way. Next day, I got up early, tested my blood, ate a properly nourishing breakfast, bought some emergency lifesavers, and headed for CJNS. The senator and Margaret were pacing the lunchroom while Mrs. Green attacked the coffee machine. Senator? What are you doing here? We need to talk. Shouldn't you read me my rights first? Look, if Denny didn't already know you were at Scoop, he would have found out soon enough. The police are in there tearing my office to pieces, and the public broadcaster is slavering outside my door. We can always slip out the back door, my dear. Heavens, <laughs> what do they make this dreadful coffee out of? Old tires? Hold it. Just back up a step, okay? The police... They had a warrant. Thanks to you. No, no. I told Denny he was there, but I didn't mention that he threatened Cochran. I threatened him? I'll bury you? Oh, for God's sake. I bought Dunlop Distributing. Marty... Dunlop controls every magazine rack in the province. And that meant I could kill Scoop any time I wanted. I had Cochran under my thumb. So what happened after I left? I made him understand that he was through, unless he kept us out of his little rag and told me who'd been slandering my family. He promised I'd have the name within 24 hours. You believed him? He had no choice. What surprised me was that the man had enough decency to warn his source before he spilled his guts. I gave him a day and left. Senator Green, what now? You're under arrest for the murder of William Cochran. What the hell? Green. It's my duty to inform you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence against you. Margaret, call my lawyer. Yes, sir. And the premier. Now, if you think you can get away with this, officer, you've got another If you'll coming. just come with me, sir. Where's the handcuffs? Handcuffs? John, have you lost your mind? The CBC is out there. Perfect. Use them. Come on, let's give them a show. Now, Senator, there's no need for you to do No need? You're arresting me for murder, aren't you? By the time we get to trial, my name will be destroyed. Why not? Oh, John. Oh, God, my chest. John. I'll call an ambulance. You print that slander and I'll bury you. Metaphorically or physically? Take your pick. I'm all a tremble. Look, Senator, this is my business, not yours. Smarten up, Marty. There's only one way to deal with cockroaches like this. Squash them. That's it? 
That's it. The tape ran out. What happened next? I was having a diabetic attack, so I left. And conveniently forgot all about the senator threatening Cochran. He's my wife's father, for Christ's sake. I can't seriously believe he did it. We found a tape deck hidden in Cochran's desk, and the tape itself was in the senator's office. How'd you know it was there? Anonymous tip. Right. Look, he had a motive. We've got the tape. It's a solid case, Murray. Am I going to have to solve this thing for you, Denny? No. We're going to solve it together. So you better get back to the hospital and find out how the old fellow's doing. Sharon, Mrs. Green, and Margaret all huddled around a little glass window, looking in at a gray old man fighting to stay alive, trying to avoid the look in Catherine Green's eyes. How's he doing? Stable. I'm afraid, Marty. Just do what you can for your mother. Look, I had nothing to do with this, Sharon. Denny said that they got a tip. A tip? From whom? I don't know, Margaret. Yet. Catherine, don't worry. Look, I'm No, yes, I'm sure of that. <laughs> what if the next attack happens at the county correctional center? Wherever it was swung downward from the rear, Cochran fell, slid off the desk, and, well, the next five or six blows weren't really necessary. Then the perpetrator wiped up the floor with back issues, gave the computers a going over, and walked in. No prints. From behind. Doesn't sound much like the senator. Big, hot tempered fellow like that. We have a computer specialist in the department, you know. Young guy in that big school down the valley. Yeah, and he's right. The hard drive is white. What's that? Thanks. Says here the Archbishop is still rigging bingo games. That's a pretty run-down excuse of a fax machine for a tech wizard like Cochran, isn't it? Cochran needed two to keep up with the volume. Your whiz kid check out this unit? No, why? Well, machines probably before his time. But we have one at home. Got it with our first 286. See, you set the switches like this, punch start, and... Voila. A log of incoming calls, including everybody's phone number. The log gave us a pretty good line on scoop contributors, but one number jumped right off the page. The senator's office. I checked back through all the items on the senator and scoop. They all focus on the endless Kaylee. Why this obsession with alcoholism? Dad's always been a drinker. Maybe, but I think it's more than that. There was something Margaret said. Shot for shot, bottle for bottle. Any word from the hospital? Margaret. He's out of intensive care. Good. So, what's up? I'm not sure. But I got a message from you. Meet me at the office at 2 o'clock. I left it. I need your help. See, I think whoever told the police about the tape in the senator's office is the one feeding the stories to Scoop. Makes sense. Yeah. And it also makes sense that it was somebody from the station. But who? Tell me about your father, Margaret. What's Harry got to do with this? He was Dad's best friend. Besides, he died almost a year ago. Yeah. How did he die, Margaret? He had a lot of medical problems. Does it matter? Liver problems? Marty! He drank himself to death. Satisfied? Where is this going, Martin? You don't think Martin... Shot for shot, bottle for bottle? You think I was working for Cochran because I blamed the senator for my father's drinking problems? Something like that. That's ridiculous. Margaret, I'm sorry. That's all right, Sharon. Check Cochran's records. I guarantee that there won't be any mention of me anywhere. Mm, there were no records. Whoever killed him wiped his hard drive. Then there's nothing to tie me to Scoop, is there? Well, I guess we'll find that out fairly soon. See, we checked his email address. Turns out he kept an electronic hidey hole. Denny promised to fax over a copy of the files as soon as it released. Is that it, Sharon? The nasty journals of William Cochran, or Who Dishes the Dirt? Turn it off. Chapter 1. Puncturing the Pops. Turn it off. It was me. I sent in the stories. The first time, it was just after my father died. Just after. It was at the wake. The senator, all flush-faced, telling the Harry stories and drinking the toast and acting far too Irish for a Scot. I just wrote something up and faxed it. And Cochran, he, he printed it, and then I just kept sending in more. 
But why? The senator killed my father. Oh, he didn't pull a trigger. He didn't have to. He just twisted the top off one more bottle. Have another drink, Harry, and another and another. So you sold out the senator to Cochran? Then you found out he was going to tell the senator. He phoned me. Told me it was important. I went down to Scoop and he said... He said he was planning to do a feature on his next issue called Snitching on the Snitches. He started telling me what he was going to say about me. Then he played the tape. The one of my father. He bugged his own office. He called it Nixonian. I tell him to turn it off, but he's so excited by the tape. It's like I'm not even in the room anymore. And there's that damn ugly monkey sitting there on the shelf leering at me. I look into its eyes and they're laughing like Cochrane. And I just picked it up and went for him. I kept hitting him. And then it was over. So you cleaned up? You erased his hard drive and took the tape? That's right. I took the original tape, timed it, then dubbed it to a blank so that... You ran out on the line, I'll kill you. And you tipped the police, popped the new tape into the senator's machine, and... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought it was time. Time for what? Last call. <laughs> That's pretty much it. She came to the station with us, and then he took her statement. I still don't understand how you got Cochran's email. He didn't. We faked it. I wrote Cochran's story, and Denny sent the facts. See, once we knew calls were coming from the senator's office, I knew it had to be Margaret. But I had no proof. We needed a confession. And you got it. A poor child. Marty, all those things I said. Oh, forget it. Your husband was in trouble, and you're a fighter. Anyway, all that matters is the senator is getting better. Well, I guess I'm going to try. It wasn't like that with Harry, by the way. Not really. Everybody knew. Knew what? That Harry had a problem. We all covered for him. Oh, the way Margaret saw it, you just made it easy for him to die. Perhaps I did. I thought, if you're not ready to help yourself, then... No, I... that's too easy. You were his best friend. Yeah, I, I do think about that. And thank you. I'm tired, Sharon. No, I'm more than tired. I'm retired, as of right now. Sharon, I'm putting you in charge. What? <laughs> now that's a real scoop. Hey, Marty, how does it feel to be married to the new boss at CJNS? to episode two of In the Blood, Another Scoop, starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin and written by Paul Ledoux. The others in the cast were Jamie Bradley as Bruce McKenzie, Jennifer Overton as Sharon Carlin, Richard Sercom as Senator Green, Anna Cameron as Catherine Green, John Fulton as Denny McNeil, Gay Hauser as Margaret, David Renton as William Cochran, George Boyd as Billy Sanders, and Joseph Rutten as Raymond Burgess. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The music was composed and performed by Dave Burton. Technical operations were by Pat Martin, with sound effects by Dermot Kenny. The associate producer was Peggy Hemsworth. In the Blood is produced and directed in Halifax by our executive producer, Bill Howell. Hi gang, Bob Bolving here to welcome you to The Mystery Project. This is episode three of Paul Ledoux's series, In the Blood. Marty Carlin has given up the stress of police work to go home to a job as an insurance investigator. Mundane, he thought. But mundane just isn't in it the way things are turning out. Marty's wife, Sharon, has taken over the management of her father's television station. And as if that isn't enough stress, another insurance investigator, one from the U.S., hits town looking for some lost property. And it's not somebody's antique jewelry. Barry Dunn stars as Marty Carlin in Any Port in a Storm. If you've ever spent any time in Nova Scotia, the phrase you're bound to run up against is, get real, boy. It's a sort of universal catch-all that can cover any level of disbelief from pure admiration to absolute scorn. Underneath it all lies a deep-seated understanding that 
everything exists as some form of illusion. Nobody wants to get sucked in. In my line of work, the name of the game is getting the facts. An accident happened. These are the facts. There was a theft. These are the facts. You sift through the rubble of motivations and emotions and tricks of memory and come up with that one little nugget of truth clenched in your closed fist. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. The fact is, a lot of the time you discover what you're holding on to is about as real as a plastic pork chop. Plastic pork chop? Now, Mr. Carlin, on your meal plan, your wife has indicated one pork chop. You need to know exactly how many protein credits that represents. Was your chop this size? Thunk, the plastic pork chop hits the best. So how many protein credits was it? Two. And last night you served up a three. I know, <laughs> because she put out all five of them, all different sizes. Hmm, a porcine parade. Yeah, prelude to a blitzkrieg of beef. Before you know it, she's got plastic steaks all over the desk, and she's shuffling them around like she's doing a hustling game or something. Now, which one is two credits? Can you point it out to me? Good. And three? I drew the line at the chicken. <laughs> You know, she was just doing her job, Marty. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a diabetic, and i got to get on top of it. She gave me this great recipe for tonight, rubber ducky a la ronde. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, since Bruce is bringing this mystery date, I think I'll stick with the pasta. And pass me the basil. Yeah, anything, as long as it doesn't bounce. Basil. So how's it going at the station? I like running through molasses. I say something basic like, media is about media. And they look at me like I've lost my mind. That is a possibility. <laughs> Not. It is. I mean, we come down here to enjoy the relaxed maritime lifestyle, and you're working harder now than you used to in Toronto. Just until I get the machine running up to speed. I mean, get this. Judith Awecki is visiting Dalhousie, and not one of those doughheads at the news desk picked up on it. Judith who? Awecki. Described by the Manchester Guardian as perhaps the most controversial female leader to emerge in Africa since Winnie Mandela. Very active in the fight against the Duguay dictatorship. But uh, after their overthrow, she broke with the EPRDF. EP what? Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. She broke with them over shootings at the university. Shootings. Nice. Mm. Well, they branded her as a radical Islamic fundamentalist. She claimed she got out of the country two steps ahead of a death squad. Been bouncing from country to country ever since, trying to get refugee status. And that's why Bruce is bringing her to supper, right? <laughs> I wish. She's a very interesting woman. So you got an interview? Hmm, on Insight, tomorrow night. And since the entire department seems to know less about her than you do... You're doing the on-air yourself, right? Right. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Sharon. You look lovely, as always. Hey, boss. I've been dying to meet your date. My... Cassie? Well, she's not exactly a date. I mean... Not in the way you mean. More so pity, but I never seem to land a cute one. <laughs> Hi, Sharon, Marty, Cassie Thompson. Cassie's with the Hartford Insurance Group, our U.S. partner. Investigations. She's up here on the case. And as we're going to be working together, I insisted Bruce bring me over to meet you. I always like to get in a bit of socializing before the dirty work. <laughs> the dirty work? Well, to tell the truth, it's nothing special. Just this little electronic gizmo belonging to one of our clients. It looks like your Navy lost it. <laughs> Hot shot organization, huh? <laughs> well, beats your guys four out of five times on maneuvers. What's it? A simulator. Right. So what does it simulate? Missile attacks. The owner of the gizmo was Micron Systems Limited, a high-rolling Washington firm that specializes in armaments development. A simulator was an experimental unit farmed out to a number of NATO vessels during the Winter War Games. It's a convenient Caribbean tanning trip for our sailor boys, but the system was a bust. After a series of failed trials, it had been mothballed. The last time anybody saw it was the day it was unloaded at CFB Halifax, the dockyards. Naval Command had made arrangements for us to meet with Bill McDonald, a senior member of the civilian administration who ran the place with military efficiency. Military efficiency. How's that for an oxymoron? The supply depot handles materials being returned to stores. A ship or office or shop sends stock back there to delete it from their DA. DA? Distribution account. You sign for all gear on a DA stock sheet. Now, once it goes back to stores, every item is classified. Somebody in Ottawa decides what to do with returned material based on a condition report from the LCMM. LC what? Life Cycle Material Manager. They're in charge of classifications. Okay, so the item is classified as serviceable, needs repair or to be scrapped. Then it's either back into stock 
to the repair shop, or to Crown Assets for sale as surplus. Any chance you sold off my client's system? No way. 5855-00-802-3565 was classified as repairable. It's all on computer. So it was sent to the repair shop? Nope. C5855 is a NATO code. All NATO designated systems are subject to a secondary review. Double zero indicates a U.S. point of origin, so notification was posted with NATO command. And 5855-00-802-3565 was held pending instructions. Which means? It was tri-walled and warehoused. And disappeared. Look, we sent the notification out 14 months ago. Since then, we processed 2 million DA accounts and... Look, pal, I got no time for excuses. Did you lose it, or was it stolen? It's a piece of gear the size of a torpedo. That kind of thing doesn't turn into a rabbit. Well, not anymore, anyway. Turn into a rabbit? Marty, I'm starting to feel like a straight man for SCTV. The boys call something that's stolen a rabbit. Because you get it past the commissioner, you get it home, you pull it out of your hat. Like I was trying to say, things used to be real slack down there. But... Big stuff doesn't rabbit anymore. Oh, come on. The place is guarded by senior citizens masquerading as bus drivers. Look, lady, your simulator is here. It may take some time to find it, but we will find it. The thing is, Bill, I don't have time. But you know what they say, time is money. I do have money. My client is prepared to offer a sizable reward for the simulator's recovery. I don't get it. The unit was a total bust, right? Apparently. So after 14 months, what's the big deal? Well, big boy, I'll tell you. That's none of your business. Cassie sounded so much like John Wayne it was scary. But the truth was, she was the pro and I was the rookie. I kept my mouth shut and watched her work the yards. By noon, the whole shift was looking for her gizmo. I had a feeling the case would wrap itself up pretty fast, so I grabbed a well-balanced, low-fat, diabetically correct lunch, no french fries, and went back to the office to get caught up on my paperwork. So, how'd it go? Good. Cassie happy? I doubt if Cassie will ever be really happy. Marty Carlin, Metro Insurance. Please leave your message after the beep. Mr. Carlin, this is E.M. Matthews, Four Winds Enterprises. I understand you have an interest in a certain piece of equipment missing from dockyard stores. I may be of some assistance. I believe you have my number. Yeah, Carlin. Bill McDonald. We got her. You and Ms. Thompson want to come down and take a look? Marty, get the lead out. Dockyards. Now. There she is. Buried, I'll tell you, but a bunch of the boys took their lunch break and kept digging. That reward's still on. You bet your boots. You got a screwdriver? Here you go. Why? To check out the control processor module, make sure everything is just where it's supposed to be. No flies on you, is there? You never buy a used car until you kick the tires and check under the hood. Oh, yeah. What? All deals are off. We are going rabbit hunting. The processor module that drove the simulator had been removed. A little 6x4 slab of plastic that would fit in a jacket pocket, and that made our investigation a criminal matter. So before the Navy went into Somalia mode, I called my old friend, Sergeant Denny McNeil, Halifax Police. In two hours, he grilled everyone worth the trouble at the dockyard. Then we were in his car on the way to Four Wheaton's Enterprise. Okay, so the control processor module's missing, but I'm still not clear what anybody'd want with it. The simulator doesn't work, right? Right on, Flash. It ever occur to you that for the simulator to create credible incoming attack patterns, it had to be programmed with extremely sensitive information on current missile guidance systems? We're talking classified with a capital C. So uh, whoever's got the card... ...is a long way towards building a better mousetrap. Four wins. Well... Let's hear what Matthews has to say. E.M. Matthews was a high-end war fright with all the prestige that four generations of portside piracy can bring. The jacket was Caldwell Brothers Tweed, but the worn elbow patches spoke volumes. Business had been uncertain on the waterfront for quite some time. Still, two things were certain. When it came to the port, Matthews knew where most of the bodies were buried. And that afternoon, he looked pretty much like a cadaver himself. You said you knew something about the simulator. 
I said that I might be of assistance. That's not quite the same thing. So we're waiting. Assist. Well, it's not as if I actually know anything about your missing simulator. Well, I heard about the reward. And as you know, Four Winds is quite active in the buying and selling of crown assets. So I thought if something had gone astray... Four being ripped off? Oh, I know very little about that side of life in the port, I can assure you. I was thinking more along the lines of, um, what if the simulator had accidentally been misnumbered, processed as surplus? I bid on so many lots. What if the simulator, without my previous knowledge, had fallen into my hands, accidentally? Ed, do you have it or not? No, most assuredly not. I've checked my records and I am positive that this device has never been in the possession of four winds. So why didn't you call back? Oh, I was just about to when you arrived, if you had made an appointment. You don't actually expect us to believe this crap, do you? I was trying to be of assistance. Right. So you want to show us how you checked for the simulator? Tell us who you called? Show us your crown assets records? Some little thing to reassure us you're telling the truth? Sergeant McNeil, I'm a busy man, and I hardly think there's any use in continuing this interview. Wise up, Matthews. That missing unit contains top secret information. Top secret? Very. Anybody involved in stealing it will be facing espionage charges. So why don't you cover your ass before we roast it? I told you I don't know a thing. And as for your blatant threats, if you don't clear out of here immediately, I will phone my solicitor. You want to borrow two bits? Cassie. <sighs> Sorry, Ed. Guess we're out of line. You certainly are. I don't know why this woman presumes to behave like she's anything but a guest in our community. But that's your problem, not mine. Yeah, well, it is a serious theft with international ramifications. Cassie may have put her case a bit strongly, but everything she said was true. And what's that supposed to mean? Nothing. But you've got my number if anything comes up. Certainly. Just one last question. How'd you get that bruise on your neck? And then Matthews went very politely ballistic. He didn't give us anything concrete, but we walked out of Four Winds knowing he was hiding something serious. But what? There was only one man I knew who might be able to tell us. A low-end wharf rat named Freddy Ferret. Who do you think I am, Carlin? Some slip-lipped little road and don't know crap from cheese? Come on, Freddy. Me and Matthew hardly know each other. Fred, everybody on the docks knows you two are in and out of each other's pockets like a handful of loose change. He's in trouble. He's in trouble? Just sitting here with you guys to get me killed? If you weren't buying a beer, forget it. Bucks for brew? My God, sometimes I feel like a one-woman world bank. Twenties okay? Jesus, lady, put that stuff away. I got to live down here, you know? Carlin, I got to drain a dragon, you know what I mean? I get the basic idea. Okay, see you later. So, what do you got? Depends on what you've got. Two fifties okay? Beautiful. Okay. Matthews has been boosting stewards out of the Gladstone Street Supply Depot for years, huh? What, electronics? Not much. He goes to that stuff that comes in the links. Rope, anchor cable, you know. You take a few hundred yards off the end of a spool, who's to say? Hard to sell a trace. But if Matthews wanted to get something out of the dockyards... Well, jeez, he got the connections, don't he? So did he boost the gizmo or not, Freddy? How should I know? Fred, I'm not getting my money's worth. Okay. Here it is. This morning, I hear about some copper wire might be coming available. So, you go to Four Winds. So, I go to the Four Winds around noon, and there's this woman in Ian's office. Heard her talking about the dockyards. Not the kind of person you usually run into down there, what you mean, know? What do you mean, not the kind of person you usually run into down here? Well, she was like an African, from Africa, you know? Talk right funny, and jeez, about six foot three. And she grabbed him by his throat and threw him right up against the wall. Judith awakened. I didn't know if she stood 6'3", but I knew she was African. And according to what Sharon had told me, she was doing an interview on CJNS. It took some arm twisting to get the bartender to change the channel. My fight and that of women everywhere are the same. To gain recognition for our beliefs and find a place for ourselves in the community of man. Or should I say, the community Lord of Lord Lipton, that's her. Well, many people find it hard to reconcile your feminist views with your religious beliefs. And some would suggest they're both pretty extreme. Judith Awake, that's an interesting twist. What do you know about it? Well, I have heard her describe the USA as the great Satan. 
I recommend you read the Quran and consider the fact that one of the few women leaders holding power on the planet is Miss Burton, a Pakistan Muslim. Did this the tape would steal missile secrets? Well, I guess that's what you and Marty have to find out. I understand that part of your reason for coming to Canada was to seek refugee status and that your application has been denied. Unfortunately, the American government has chosen to use Ethiopia as a shining example of progress on human rights in Africa. As a result, they refuse to recognize the political prisoners in detention without a trial and the numerous disappearances of government opponents. To admit my claim would be to admit they are wrong. Their allies have followed suit. So, what's next? For my country? I don't know. I meant for you. Oh, I see. Well, I'll continue looking for a home. Cassie took off to report in. Danny decided he'd better keep an eye on Matthews, and I went looking for Judith Oweke. By the time I got to see JNS, I discovered she and Sharon had gone. Our place for dinner. Are you in there? We're in the kitchen. Marty, Judith Oweke. Judith, my husband, Marty. Hello. Sharon has been instructing me in the mysteries of the porch to Halibut. <laughs> Good, she's a master. <laughs> Glass of wine? No, thanks. Uh, Sharon, can we talk? Uh, sure. Excuse us, Judith. Certainly. I'll watch the poaching. What's the problem? Oh, nothing too serious. Just that your friend in the other room is the prime suspect in an espionage case. <laughs> yeah, right. Sharon, we're talking about missile guidance systems. <gasps> Want me to sneak a look in her purse? This is serious. Oh, tell me, Marty, what would she do with information on missile guidance systems? The way Judith tells it, her friends are still fighting with leftovers from the Vietnam War. Look, I don't know what she's up to. I just want to find out. Hello? Yes, this is. Max Karen, for you. Okay, thanks, Judith. I'll take it in here. Marty, we got trouble. Just a second. I've got it, Judith. Good. I'm hanging up. Judith. Our Judith? That's right. Christ. What's up? I just found Matthews. He's been kneecapped. I met Denny outside the infirmary ER and he filled me in. We'd gone back to Four Winds, but it was shut up tight. So we cruised over to Tower Road to check out Matthews' place. Whoever had been to see Matthews had not been out at the camper. The place was a shambles and so was Matthews. Judith Oweke had an alibi. Looked like we had some new players in the game and they were dead serious about their work. We smashed both of Matthew's kneecaps with a baseball bat to prove it. We found Matthew's jammed into a bed in the ER corridor. Both legs and casts, placed on Demerol, and still terrified. I told you. I've got nothing to say. Well, that's not real bright, Ed, given the situation. What, what situation is that? This is espionage. You're in way over your head. Oh. oh. My guess is you told them where to find what they want. But if it's not there, they'll come back. There's no mythical it. And even if there was, they would go away and leave me alone, which is what I would like both of you to do now. You're dreaming in Technicolor, Ed. Once they got what they want, you're expendable. Busy corridor like this on a Friday night? Anybody could just walk right in? Or... Uh, I demand protection. Talk first. Okay, but I want a deal. Nothing I tell you can be used against me. Forget it. Oh, don't be a fool, McNeil. They've got the processor already. If you let them get away... You talk, you get a deal. Get me into my own room. Then I'll talk. Aweke had hired Matthews to get the processor module. It probably took him less than half an hour. Then he heard at the dockyards about the reward... Matthews being Matthews, he figured it was a good time to renegotiate his price. Oweke's negotiating style left a lot to be desired. She roughed him up, promised he was a dead man if he didn't deliver, and then went to do the interview with Sharon. Cool as a cucumber. No wonder he was nervous when we showed it four winds. After we left, he went home to discover our two mystery boys waiting for him. He didn't know them, but they were definitely not African. They worked him over like pros. He gave them the processor and all the details of his meeting with Oweke. And yes, the information seemed to be very important to them. 
Denny called the station. Given that the case was in the national interest, he was able to order up an RCMP SWAT team. Then we headed for Matthew's drop zone. Carlin. Marty, Bruce, Cassie and I just heard about Matthews. What's happening? I don't know. Uh, he isn't talking, but I guess whoever got to him also has the processor. Marty? Sounds like he stepped in some elephant doo-doo. You find a wakey? Yeah, she said she was negotiating with Matthews about shipping medical supplies. <laughs> a regular Mother Teresa. And while you were wasting time chasing her, the real bad boys get the gizmo and are gone. Smooth work. Thanks. What do you want us to do now? Nothing. It's too late. So I'm going to get Bruce to take me back to the hotel, and then I'll phone in the report. The company is going to be very disappointed that we screwed the pooch, and I hope you realize that I'm not about to take responsibility. And what was all that made up? Hey, we let Cassie get the credit for this takedown, and that swollen American ahead of hers won't fit into a ten-gallon hat. Well, when you put it like that... The fact is, I don't trust her. Cow Bay is a hell and gone bit of coastal real estate on a back road a half hour out of Halifax. Not much there, a few boarded up cottages, a road that dead ends on the beach. Our team parked behind a broken down chip shack. Walked to the shore, settled in behind some scrub, and waited. Midnight. A single car pulled in. That's right, sugar. My friend here has a 12 gauge. Don't turn. Keep the flashlight pointed at the ground. Where'd she come from? Probably parked behind a cabin down the beach. Where's Mr. Matthews? He was detained. Who are you? Let's just say we're associates. We have the processor. Do you have the cash? What's she playing at? Wheels within wheels. I have the money. Okay, then this is how we're going to play it. Turn your flashlight to the right, 20 degrees. See the attache case? Yes, I see it. Go over and open it. But remember, we're armed. Take the card, leave the money. That's all there is to it. Yes, it is always so easy to do business in America. She's got it. All units, go. Police! Please! All of you! We ran them all in. Judith confessed. It turned out she cut a deal with the Pakistani Secret Service. She gets them the processor, they give her refugee status. Her Ethiopian passport was running out. She had no choice. Cassie didn't take to wearing cuffs. Couldn't believe we'd have the gall to arrest her. Typical. I wonder where she thought she was. This is just plain crazy, Bruce. Tell him that I was having supper with you when Matthews was assaulted. That's true. And anyway, this is crazy. She's on our side? No. People on our side don't kneecap old men to get information. You saying I did? Matthews identified your two friends. My friends? At the takedown, it was pretty obvious who they were working for. Oh, hey, you can't blame me for the dust a couple over-enthusiastic kids kick up. And I guarantee they won't testify against me. Well, worse comes to worse, we'll go with charges related to the Official Secrets Act. Possession of stolen goods, theft, and conspiracy to deal in restricted arms. You did have the processor module in your possession. Says who? Get real by it, sitting right there on the table. I'll tell you what, Denny. If you knock the parrot off your shoulder, then I'll kick the cow pie off my boots. Check the serial number in your documentation against the one on that card, because they are not the same. <laughs> but you told me to wire the Hartford Group, and I told them the claim was closed. My investigations have led me to believe the original module has been destroyed. Serial number 3356XFD. She's right. The serial number doesn't match. You destroyed the original processor? That's privileged information. Then what in the heck is the purpose of this dummy processor? Jeez. She's CIA. What? This module is loaded with data that'll mess up Pakistani defense systems. Good, isn't it? You're going to use Aweke to teach them a lesson. Let's just say the U.S. Navy does not take kindly to anybody messing with their toys. Now I think it's about time you called Ottawa and talked this thing through with my friends at CC. So... Everybody walked, including the two boys who worked Matthews over. 
E.M. came down with a bad case of amnesia, and that was the last time anyone ever saw his old Caldwell brother's tweed. Didn't go with the new Mercedes. Sharon and I drove Judith Oweke to the airport. She was headed for Pakistan. Her mission had failed, but she was convinced they'd keep their word. It was a question of honor. And she gave us a copy of the Koran. I'm working my way through it. Slowly. You've been listening to Episode 3 of In the Blood by Paul Ledoux. Featured in the cast today, Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, Jennifer Overton as Sharon, Jamie Bradley as Bruce McKenzie, John Fulton as Denny McNeil, Bruce Armstrong as E.M. Matthews, Mass Munyati as Judith, and Laurie LaViolette as Freddie Ferret. Our special guests were Martha Irving as Cassie Thompson and Tony Foster as Bill. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The music was composed and performed by Dave Burton. The recording engineer was Pat Martin with sound effects by Dermot Kenny. The associate producer is Peggy Hemsworth. In the Blood is produced and directed in Halifax by our executive producer, Bill Howell. Hi gang, Bob Boving here with The Mystery Project and another installment of our series, In the Blood by Paul Ledoux. Marty Carlin, along with his wife Sharon and their teenage son Pat, are gradually getting their new life in Halifax onto an even keel. But when an investigator and a journalist share the same house, little blips in the weather are bound to occur. Hurricane warnings are up. In the Blood, Episode 4, Hook, Line, and Sinker, starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin. You can't stop the tide, right? It comes in, it goes out, and things mostly look the same. But if you look closer, you'll discover things a little different from what you remembered. Nothing ever stays the same. Ever since I was a five-year-old with a bucket and shovel on Black Rock Beach. But growing up in Halifax, you get used to the ebb and flow of things, or at least you're supposed to. For the past few months, I've been riding a riptide. My partner had been murdered. I had been diagnosed as diabetic and quit the Toronto Police. Then I moved back home, started a career as an insurance investigator, and watched my wife take over a TV network. No problemo. But then, my son, Pat, 16 years old and deeply committed to grunge guitar, finished up grade 11 at Riverdale Collegiate and hit Nova Scotia like a subway car, ramming into a schooner. Me? Sailing Chester Race Week? I don't know a jib from a poop, or vice versa. No way. Yes way. It's time you learned. Very big social event. Tall sails, fast boats... Charming young women. Nights afloat on a sea of single malts and ten penny ale? <laughs> I would know. The closest thing I ever got to Chester Race Week was getting kicked out of a yacht club once. Mm, a tragic moment for romantic young yachting types everywhere. So, here it is. The Stroll, part one. Rough cut. They call it The Stroll, a four-block strip of Gottingen Street that drug dealers, runaways, and teenage prostitutes all call home, and a source of growing concern in Metro. The murder rate soars, and the toll in human tragedy goes uncounted. It's here on the stroll that our story begins, with a 16-year-old prostitute whose life is in danger. I started training tricks when I was 13 and a half. I had to on account of Charlie was in trouble. Charlie Noonan, your pimp. He wasn't my pimp, right? He was my boyfriend. He loved me, and he needed the money on account of he was in way deep. Trip for crack and stuff. Trevor said if he didn't get $200, he was going to hire some guys from Preston to do, Charlie. Do him? Like, some harm. So you got him the 200 I think so. It only took about three hours. Are you scared? Oh, really? After six years with my stepfather? Not. Charlie promised once we got some money, we'd go to Toronto. Like, whoa. So I decided we'd be in the How much did you pay for this interview? $1,000 for exclusive rights on a two-part documentary. Pour me some wine. Sure. So paying for an interview must be CJNS first. But yeah, they're a backward lot. A Listen to this. First bad trick. He picked me up around 1 o'clock, eh? In his van, and he took me over to Burnside, and I got in back, and he had a knife. The girl was raped, beaten, and left naked on a back road. So after? I told Charlie I couldn't work the street no more. And he said, fine, but I had to get them some new girls. Like... I could hang around the Fairview video arcades and nobody would bug me. And Charlie and Trevor couldn't hang out because they were too old? No, because they were too black. 
You think so? In Fairview? Friggin' A. Those girls were still in junior high. I wouldn't do it. So they beat on me, and the cops showed up at the emergency and took me down to the station to talk to them. And then what happened? They tried to make me drop a paper on Charlie. Drop a paper? Like, rat him out. I said, like, no way. And they said if I didn't, they couldn't protect me. And I said, to hell with you. And when I was coming out of the station, it was like a drive-by. They tried to kill me. Let's take a break. Fade to black. Commercial break. Is that TV or what? That's TV, all right. Oh, too lowbrow for you? It, like, speaks for itself. I just don't like to see that kid exploited by Johns or pimps or TV exposés. This is a story that has to get told, Marty, and we are not exploiting her. She's getting paid. Yeah, and that bothers me, too. Kind of blurs the line between journalism and entertainment programming. It's not... Oh, God, you're as bad as the guys down at the station. What do you think, Pat? Hooker got a line. You know it's gonna sink her. What the people thinking? If she was coke, they want to drink her. Pat, I told you to can that rap stuff around here. What do you want me to say, then? I don't know. Something intelligent? I just did. But you didn't get it. Never mind. I'll translate. The show will get ratings because sex sells and she sells sex. And you're worried because so does mom. I sell sex? Everybody in the media sells sex. And sex kills? <laughs> you have a very bleak perspective on life for a 16-year-old. It's genetic. In the blood. What you two are really arguing about is integrity. Is mom exploiting this girl because her ratings will soar, or is she doing it to get Halifax to face the fact that their hometown is Canada's top recruitment center for underage prostitutes? Mom? I care about this problem, Pat, and I am a serious journalist. Welcome back to The Stroll, a CJNS special report on teenage prostitution in Halifax. I'm your host, Sharon Green, and we're back with the story of a 16-year-old working girl who has recently turned in her pimp. Joining us now are Sergeant Denny McNeil from the Halifax Police Department and Mr. Clarence Saunders, the chairman of Shelter, a transition house established last year to help get children at risk off the streets. That's Billy. Welcome what? to the stroll. Ma'am. That is Billy Thanks, Saunders, the guy who shot so, Patty. Clarence, tell us it's about Billy, the all right. We in the old days, nobody got away with calling him Clarence. So this guy was like a black panther? He was a wannabe with a hell of an afro, not quite the same thing. But you told me he blew up that construction dude's office, right? Yeah, but they never proved it. Now it gets really interesting. And when necessary, the police. Protection from the police? That's right. Uh, take the case at hand. This young woman needed protection, and she was intimidated by the police, practically driven out of the station, and as a result, her life was in danger. Now, that's a total misrepresentation of the facts. What happened was we told the young lady the truth. The only way to really protect her was to get the fellows who assaulted her off the streets, and the only way to do that was for her to testify against them. You know that as well as I do. Yes, and once she came to the shelter, we were able to convince her to do that very thing. But if we weren't here, where would she have gone? If the force had the sensitivity to gain these kids... And confidence, how are we supposed to do that with you telling them they need protection I'm from us? just telling it like it is. Moreover, if the police were doing their job, the stroll wouldn't even exist. Put it on pause, okay? Carlin Residence? Yeah? When? Is she okay? Oh, thank God. I'm on my way. What's up? Darlene, the girl on the video. Somebody just took a shot at her through the window of the safe house. It wasn't a coincidence. The safe house was on an inconspicuous street out in Birdland. But by the time we got there, the place was crawling with cops. The neighbors were not impressed. Judging by the blasted out picture window, the safe house was no longer a secret to at least some of the local bottom feeders. We found Darlene huddled in a big armchair in the TV room, with Danny on one side and Billy on the other. She looked terrified. Darlene? He tried to kill me. Twice. It's okay. It'll be okay. I'm scared. So what happened, Denny? She was standing in the front room when the glass blows out. Classic drive-by. Not enough light for the security cameras to pick up the punks in the car, though. It was Charlie and Trevor. I thought they were in custody. They made bail. You let them out? A judge let them out. All we had was the procurement charge. Did you get a good look at them, darling? I didn't have to. It was him. He told me. He said he'd come for me. Right. We'll find him. You've got to keep him in jail. You've got to. 
Don't worry, they will. Or CJNS is going on the warpath. The minute Sharon made her threat, Billy went from irate to white hot. He demanded Denny go after Charlie that very second and insisted on going with him to make sure he was found. Denny took me along for the ride. I think he was afraid he might pop Billy if they got in the car alone. I jumped at the chance. I needed to figure out Billy's angle. One thing was for sure. He had one. Billy always had an angle. I don't know. If I just pulled a drive-by, I don't think I'd be down here on the street. Charlie will be here. I know his style. Confident guy, eh? Made it, Teflon. You know, for five years now, he's been turning out teenagers, shipping them off to Toronto. But none of the girls had ever talked until Darlene. God. Look at this scene. Changed a bit in the past 20 years, hasn't it? Yeah, kids. Sprung out on crack. Little girls on the corner peddling their ass. You know, it's magical what another 20 years of racism, corruption, and indifference can do for places and... Uh, in case you haven't noticed, you've got no real audience here, Billy. We're just two guys who know you too well to be impressed by that soapbox. Is that true, Marty? You turned into one of those guys who don't give a damn what happens to little girls out on the street? That's not what I meant, and you know it. Look, let's just get the shooters off the street and save the brawl for the tavern, okay? Sure, Mark. So what's with this guy, Trevor? Darlene blames everything on him. That's how Charlie works it. Nothing's ever his fault. It's always Trevor on his case. <laughs> Trevor is his favorite cousin from Preston. He works for Charlie as a kind of all-purpose boogeyman. Most of the girls are so green they buy it. For a while, anyway. And by the time they wise up, they're so wrecked on crack. It doesn't matter. And there he is. Hold it, Charlie. We've been looking for you. Denny took Charlie in and had a good run at him. I'd like to tell you what went down, but with Billy tagging along, there was no way Denny could bend the rules and let me eavesdrop. After about an hour, Trevor showed up with a lawyer and two of the older girls. Looked like Charlie was going to come up with an alibi. Billy and I sat in Denny's empty office, waiting to hear the worst. Want to smoke? Gave him up. You want to talk about it? Sorry, I just have a little trouble relating, you know? It was nearly 20 years ago, Martin. Yeah, yeah, it was 20 years ago. But Patty's still dead. You think that there's a day goes by I don't think about that? I can't bring Patty back, Marty, and neither can you. But if he was here, I'll tell you what he'd be doing, anything it takes to shut down that stroll. Is that what you're doing, Billy? Anything it takes? What's that supposed to mean? I don't trust you. I'm trying to help that little girl. You with me on that or not? They walked. Congratulations, McNeil. Another job. Well done. Any chance they didn't do it? None. Those two girls' stories were word for word. No way she's safe out there now. Or anywhere else until we learn how they found the safe house. Billy. Somebody must have talked. Somebody who works at the house. More likely a cop on a take. Uh, it's possible, but not likely. Wouldn't be enough in it for them. Besides, we got a clean force. Sure. All those years Ada ran her place without a bust. Everybody was clean back then, too, eh? That was different. Why? Because the girls took care of half of the city of Halifax or because there was no black faces in the mix? <sighs> Maybe a bit of both, but that was a long time ago. And it wasn't any cop who tipped Charlie. First time they shot at her, she was coming out of this police station. How nervy can you get? Well, I probably followed her here from emergency. Were you guys... Look, it could have been anybody, including a TV cameraman. The important thing is whether Darlene will still testify. After this, if we can find her a new place to stay where she'll feel safe. If you aren't from Nova Scotia, maybe you don't know Chester. How to describe it? Hyannis Port North. A watering hole for the wealthy of New England, tucked away in one of the prettiest little harbors on the South Shore. Chester has class. And Chester Race Week is a very big event for the yachting set. The Green Cottage was an old ten-bedroom mansion sitting on a point of land overlooking the basin. The senator and Sharon's mother were laying low. A cruise to Alaska they'd always wanted to take. So we had the place to ourselves, along with Darlene and Denny and his men. So when's she going to show up? Listen, Pat... I think we better have a talk about this girl before she shows up. Roll. 
Well, there's nothing glamorous about her or what she's been doing. She's a kid in trouble, right? I know that, Dad. I mean, this isn't like some much music fantasy. No kidding. She's been abused by her stepfather, victimized by a pimp, and exploited by a long line of men who don't deserve the title. I've got the picture. Yeah, you may have the picture, but you've never seen it up close. She's got to impress somebody to prove she's worth being alive. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be Danny or your mom. She's going to come on like she's Madonna. Hey, I can handle it. And I'm not that easy to impress. You are a pushover. Remember that, and maybe you've got a chance. I'm just trying to think about how bad this kid is hurting, too, okay? Okay. But don't get sucked in, okay? Okay. And if you sleep with her, I'll kill you, okay? Oh, for Christ's sake! I am not about to sleep with some stone hoe, Dad. I mean, sex today is the world's most dangerous crapshoot. Please! <laughs> well, excuse me. There's your mom. And darling Darlene. <laughs> you stupid. <laughs> I should be here, watching the place. It's the opening reception. If we don't show, half the point will be over here to find out why. Okay, but I sure don't relish the idea of us all spending the weekend running up and down the basin in your sailboat. <laughs> Sorry, but that's the drill. Anyway, it's time you and Pat learned to sail. You're going to love it too, Darlene. I already do. Used to have a client took me down here all the time. Real handsome guy. Looked like Richard Gere. Right. In Pretty Woman. So, Darlene, how do you think Charlie found out the location of the safe house? Charlie's a very smart guy, you know. He could sniff it out. Pass the wine, please, Pat. Uh, sure. Uh, Marty, I can't... Sorry, Darlene. You're underage. I've been drinking in bars since I was 12. Oh, sorry, Darlene. If it was just the family, but uh, Denny is on duty. We're out of his jurisdiction. Now, give me a glass of wine, or I'll go down the road and see what some of the guys at the marina have on board. Uh, maybe I should see how the boys are doing down at the gate. Uh, I'll be back in a half hour or so. Bye. Don't forget to write. Pat, my glass? Forget it. Come on, Dad. You let me have a glass of wine whenever I want it. It's still our call, and the answer is no. Your mother and I have a party to go to. Now, don't forget. The bar is closed, and now I'm going to lock it. Thanks for the show of trust. Think nothing of it. That's what fathers are for. That girl is very dangerous. And very sharp. Yeah. We should have chained Pat up before we left. <laughs> so let's do the do and get back as fast as we can. We'll discuss it after you stuff your face full of hors d'oeuvres. Stuff my face? In this company? Right. You're a diabetic, Marty, and you were so busy worrying about Darlene, you barely touched your dinner. So? So now you are getting very cranky. Eat before you get totally obnoxious, okay? Okay, okay. I'll... Marty! Billy, what the hell are you doing here? Missionary work. First black face they've seen in Chester since the slave trade. Well, not quite, but I do stand out in the crowd. Makes the locals nervous? It does. I like that. Bill's a guest of Ray Burgess. Ray Burgess? I'll be a neighbor. Raymond Burgess was the only son of a South End dynasty. Old money, but there wasn't much of it left by the time Ray came around, so he got into real estate. In 20 years, he parlayed his political connections into a sizable fortune, and in the process, scarred downtown Halifax with a dozen ugly office towers. Nothing he did aged well. He says, Carlin, you look like hell. Thanks, Ray. You haven't changed a bit. Oh, I keep in shape. As a matter of fact, I have a young wife who gives me a hell of a workout. <laughs> <laughs> She's a perfectly respectable lady, boss. Boss? You actually call him boss? Well, why not? He was VP in charge of construction. I never make a move without him. <laughs> I felt like I was losing my mind. Back in our radical days, me and Patty and Billy were working together to stop Ray's first really big development. Things were actually going our way until somebody redecorated Burgess's office with a stick of dynamite. Patty... Billy. He went to tear his head off. The story is Billy was cleaning his shotgun. And that's how Patty died. But I thought you ran the clinic. He's the chairman of the board. Volunteer work. It's pretty hands-on, but Ray gives me all the time I need for it. So how's Darlene doing? Oh, she is amazing. We are going to have ourselves one hell of a part two. So, do you shoot anything yet? Not yet. Shoot anything? I brought the minicam with me. So the place is wired? 
quite, it's not quite that Orwellian, but I wish I'd had a camera running at dinner. You were great. Thanks, but I don't want to be part of any freaking documentary. The film's a winner, Marty. And it's being made for a very good cause. Am I in some kind of a bad nightmare here or what? I hate you guys. And you're conspiring with my wife to turn me into a subject. Ah, uh, Marty, you'd better have something to eat. I'm not hungry. Marty, I think you'd better come with me. Oh, we're just starting to have some fun, aren't we, Ray? To tell the truth, Marty, I think you're a bit pissed. Oh, I'm pissed. Sure, I'm pissed. After seeing what you and your political toadies did to downtown Halifax? That's enough. Hey. You're having a hypoglycemic attack, Marty. I... Billy, help me get him sitting down. Ray, get some juice. Now. 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 My next clear memory was looking down into a glass of orange juice, then looking up into the faces of a dozen concerned yachting types, and Ray and Sharon and Billy. You okay, Marty? What did I do? Don't worry about that. Come on, I'll get you home. A Volvo moving through a corridor of fog. Thick, wet, hopeless. The way it can sit over a coastal road in Nova Scotia, summer or no. And me sitting beside my silent wife feeling very old and very tired. And like an absolute fool. Sorry. Not your fault. It was just seeing Burgess. It just... He's okay, Marty. It'll take a lot to make me believe that. How could Billy... Even Billy... Marty! We got trouble! Danny, what's the matter? The kids are gone. Yeah, I just came off shift at the gate. Thought I'd better poke my head in. And the liquor cabinet was cracked. The place was a mess. And the kids were gone. I got my guys out combing the point. There's got to be but... something to go on here. No, I don't think so. I, I already looked. There's nothing. Hey, on top of the TV. The video camera? It's not out there. Was that there? What? The camera. I don't remember it being on the TV. It wasn't. Look it up. How do you turn... Here, you just... She's back. Where'd that come from? Hall Closet. Hi, this is Pat Carlin reporting on the B&E recently pulled in my father's liquor cabinet by hard-nosed house guest Darlene X. Why'd you do it, honey? You want some? Thanks, but my 12-step program frowns on it. Will you turn that off? Not until you confess. By the way, I was in the can when this gross violation of personal property in the Liquor Control Act occurred, right? You keep that thing running, I'm going to start taking off my clothes. Darlene pulls a peeler. Fabulous. Go jungle. Sorry, I don't have the time to entertain children. That really hurts, Darlene. Not. Who'd you just phone? Maybe just the top. You ever been with a woman, Pat? Hey, this is the family channel, honey. I don't think you have. I don't think you really know how good it can be. Come on. I just need you to tell them. Don't you want me? Sure. But it wouldn't be right. How about on your sailboat? Sailboat can be real sexy, Pat. I'm not a John, Darlene. And you aren't a hoe no more. So, hey, promise me the confession and I'll rewind and zap the porn. Who cares? Okay, so I cracked the liquor cabinet. Call the cops. Bust me. Hey, wait, Darl. Oh, God. Who did she phone? What? Who did she phone? Denny. Yeah? Get the line, trace the last number dialed, then meet us on the wharf. They're not together. How do you know? Marty, both the sailboat and the speedboat are gone. Sorry, I just got here tonight. Didn't know we had two boats. So she took off. He went after her. But where? In this kind of fog, it better not be far. All she had to do was get around Denny at the gate, right? And she knew where the marina was. I got the number. You probably guessed. It was Charlie's. She called... She won't go to the marina. Why not? Remember what Billy said? The first black in Chester since... No way Charlie's going to come into town and not get attention. Well, where else could she go? The public wharf in the basin. Right off the highway, easy to find, and just enough out of the way. You sure? Well, it's a good guess, that's all. But in this kind of fog, we've got to find them. The tide's low. And if you don't know the rocks... Danny radioed the mounting marine patrol. The next-door neighbor had a very fast boat. And Sharon and I weren't waiting. Our neighbor, Ray Burgess. There's about 50 boats in the basin. 
Anything moving around the government wharf? Nothing. Check out towards the base. I'll increase the sweep. Hold on. Anything? Hold on. Two bunks. Heading? North by Norrie. She's on the wrong side. Ray put her to the mast. That big ugly stink bite just went into a plane. And we were too late. We heard the first bump. A sickening crash. The splintering of wood and a moan of fiberglass crumpling. Billy manned the searchlight as we all frantically scanned the rocks. There! Your, your sailboat! It's aground! The speedboat! Where's the speed? There! Port beam! It's empty! Hot! Hot! Answer me! Here! We're here! To the left! Got it! Here! Yeah! Yes! Dad! I've got our lead, but she's not much of a swimmer, Dad! Me neither! Hang on to her! Hang on! I don't know, I just... I just wanted to sail away. So you called Charlie? Yeah. He tried to shoot you, remember? He said it was a warning from Trevor. He tried to stop him. He said Trevor was going to kill me no matter what if I dropped a paper on them. I told him about the boat. He said we could take off by boat, just us two. So I told him about the government wharf. Sail away and leave his other women? That's a load of crap, Darlene, and you know it. I don't know nothing. I just... I get so scared. I don't think right. I just... He's all I've had since I was 13 years old. No one else cared, ever. Darlene... We all care about you. Yeah, you care deeply. The deal's for a two-part documentary. I want my one K's worth. You treated me like a trick. I said that to make sure you wouldn't run away. Right. Look, I sunk the boat. Must have been worth a ton. You gonna charge me or what? I looked into piracy, but I think we'll have to settle for theft over a thousand. You charge me, I won't testify against Charlie. Big deal. We picked Charlie and Trevor up on the 103 highway. Both of them were armed. Can't put them away for as long as they deserve, but one way or another, they're going away. Uh, I told her to take the boat, so there's no theft. Pat, she almost got you both killed. I won't testify against her. What's the angle? There isn't always an angle, you know. Really? Really. And until you can learn to trust somebody besides a pimp, well, you ain't going nowhere, kid. Right. I'd like to try. If I can still stay, until I testify. You don't really need to keep her, you know. Now they got Charlie. Hey, Billy, new beginnings? Sometimes they make sense. Besides, Pat would like it. Right, hero? Right. But I'd make a hell of a better hero if I knew how to handle a boat. What do you think, Mom? Sure. But I think your father is going to have to ask Ray to borrow his sunfish... And get you some lessons. Right. Let's start small and work up. You've been listening to Hook, Line, and Sinker, the fourth episode of In the Blood, written by Paul Ledoux. In the cast tonight, you heard Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, Jennifer Overton as Sharon, Brad Kennedy as Pat, John Fulton as Danny, Joseph Rutten as Ray Burgess, George Boyd as Billy Saunders, and Rachel Grover as Darlene. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. Original music was provided by Dave Burton. The recording engineer was Pat Martin with sound effects by Dermot Kenny. The associate producer is Peggy Hensworth. In the Blood is produced and directed in Halifax by our executive producer, Bill Howell. I'm Bob Bolding for The Mystery Project, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. Hi, gang. Bob Bolden here for The Mystery Project. This time we're at Episode 5 of In the Blood, our Halifax series written by Paul Ledoux. Music has charms to soothe a savage breast, William Congreve said. But he wasn't talking grunge bands. Through his son Pat, Marty Carlin is about to get caught in some dangerous feedback. Barry Dunn stars as Marty Carlin in Sleeps with Fishes. My son, Pat, is 16, and we have this half-serious game we play. Who done it? 
here's a mystery. A young man right at the peak of his career steps onto the street after a hard day's work. As he lights a smoke, he is run down by a long black Lincoln. Right in front of witnesses, speculation is rife. Why didn't the car stop? Why didn't the young man get out of the way? An insurance investigator struggles with the facts, sifts through the clues. Finally, a car is found and mystery solved. The young man simply didn't hear the car coming. The car didn't stop because the driver neither saw the victim nor heard the impact of the body hitting the car. Why? The young man was a guitar player in a grunge band. The killer was his producer driving home from the same midnight session. He forgot to take off his sunglasses, and they were both deaf. Pat got it. But I don't think he found the solution as amusing as I did. Turn it down! I'm not kidding, young man. Turn it down before I come up there and garret you with your e string. Thank you. Now, would you mind coming down for dinner? No time. No time? I've got a session in half an hour. Tough. It's on the table. Sit and eat. Yeah, well, mind if you're. Hey, it won't kill you to be a couple of minutes late. If I'm late, the guys will kill me. The studio costs 35 bucks an hour. Don't sweat it. You can take the car. Really? I don't need it. Thanks, Dad. What I don't get is how a 16-year-old guitar player can arrive in a town and three weeks later be recording an album. It's just a demo, Mom. But Larry says I give Mudchuck a fresh edge. And the music scene down here is so volatile that anything can happen. Who's Larry? The guy runs the studio. He produced Sleeps with Fishes for a CD. Sleeps with Fishes? Hmm, the hottest group in Halifax. They're in high rotation on our station. I did an arts and entertainment feature with them last month on special reports, remember? Oh, right. The girl with the multiple studs in her lips. Ugh. But describe this Larry guy to me. Bald head, black beard, big guy. Your age, maybe, but still chillin'. Second name, Staples. Little Larry Staples. <laughs> we got thrown out of frat parties together. Frat parties? Pop, did you ever hear that theory about the end of history? What about it? You should try. See you later. Hang on. What? I'm coming with you. Dad! Hey, it's time I learned what this grunge stuff is all about. Aren't you a bit too old to get into passion? Little Larry used to swear he was born weighing 200 pounds. He lied so good you could almost always believe him. He was managing bands before he got out of high school, booking all the events at the Dell Sub by the end of his second year, and had an act signed by a Canadian label somewhere around the time April Wine moved to Montreal. I figured by now he'd be booking trade shows at the airport Holiday Inn, not playing granddaddy to a super hot young scene. But that's Larry, the original moving target. But Larry and my son in the same recording studio? I couldn't resist. The Music Mark was a deliberately unhip name for an establishment called the epicenter of the East Coast grunge explosion. But the location, jammed between two hawk shops and Gadigan Street, was just about perfect. The wrought iron gates across the front entrance were a droll evocation of Graceland. The perfect Larry touch. He looked about the same, except the ponytail was turning gray. You were actually a cop? Yeah. Weird you out? Yeah. You always had a Batman complex. Everything was a moral issue with you. <laughs> Maybe you're right. And now insurance investigation. Typical. Well, I certainly never thought of Metro Insurance Group as a force of moral good. Well, maybe not, but a pretty decent insurance company, as insurance companies go. They got my policies, each and every one. Yeah, this gear must have cost a pretty penny. Yeah, the worst is you have to keep buying more. I started out recording groups in my apartment on a used 8-track. Used to send the singer into the bathroom for echo, and the guitar players kept breaking my bed frame, bouncing around in the middle of solos, but hey, I felt alive. Then, whammo, these local kids I'm recording for fun are suddenly special. I mean, sleeps with fishes on the cover of Rolling Stone? God bless America. I must have made you proud. Are you kidding? Before you know it, guys from the majors are nibbling flakes off my skin like a school of guppies. Well, so what I don't get is if, if everything's so great, then why are you hanging around with Mud Shark? I mean, they can barely play. Hey, man, very few of these bands would win any awards for musicianship. That's not what it's about. Then what? 
Ego, greed, anger, depression, sexual frustration, rebellion, passion, and death. Same as always. Pat and Mud Shark have all the major food groups covered. Besides, I need to keep new acts coming in the door. Big labels steal every band I develop. A loyalty factor? When an L.A. lizard in a long black limo is waving a big check under their collective nostrils? Forget it. So I drew up a contract for new bands that uh, gave me a piece of their publisher. Makes sense. Worst idea I ever had. I signed a couple of deals like that, and suddenly word on the street is I'm exploiting artists. Half the acts I produce are boycotting. So I'm down to Mud Shark. I see. So at the moment, I'm about as hot as doggy do at spring thaw. But I've got an ace in the hole. What's that? A dat. Digital audio tape? Looks like an oversized pillbox. Yeah, but it can hold more music than a rack of analog multitracks. This little hunk of plastic is the only copy of an album's worth of unreleased Sleeps With Fishes material. And their first release is on the charts with a bullet. And you own the rights? Possession's nine-tenths of the law, right? Well, not exactly. Eh, close enough for rock and roll. They dump me. So the only way they'll get their grubby little paws on this tape is to buy me out. Sound fair, Batman? Fair, maybe. Legal? No. Yeah, there ought to be a law. Larry, can you come out here and stomp this toad, or do I have to do it myself? Yikes! We got trouble, Batman. Larry, we're just about ready to start smashing Mike. Don't waste your time, Mel. I'm insured. Mel? Melanie Ash sleeps with fishes. Sound familiar? Oh, that Mel. Uh, good album, man. It sucked. And it's history. Who's the cop? I'm not a cop. Then you should get a new barber. Arrest him. Arrest Larry? Yeah, arrest him. Well, I'd love to, but I'm not a cop. Marty works for my insurance company. An insurance salesman? Sorry, I didn't recognize you without the plaid suit. I want my tape. If it was just me, Mel, I'd give it to you. But you hired a lawyer. So I had to hire a lawyer, and now we got two lawyers talking. The meter's running. How long do you think before they'll stop? That's my music on my tape, and I want it now. I like to think of it as our music. I want my tape. So sue me. I'd rather shoot to slime ball. Kid's got a gun. Jesus, Eric. We're through kidding around, Larry. You gonna shoot me, Marty, and the whole band? We just want the tape. Well, you're not gonna get it. So get out of here. Don't you yell at her. Everybody, just take it easy now. Eric, put it down. I told you I could take care of you, didn't I? Didn't I? Hey, dork breath. What? Hey! <laughs> Five seconds later, the gun was in my pocket, Larry had Eric pinned up against the wall, and Pat was retuning his guitar. We all ended up down at the cop shop till three in the morning. I called Sharon. She was still up when we arrived home. We're home. Pat, are you okay? Perfect. I just trashed my entire music career over a fake gun. Well, it could have been real, young man. Save your breath, Sharon. He's already heard the lecture. What happened to the fish kids? They'll get off with a slap on the wrist. No big deal. It is a very big deal. Sleeps with fishes are gods down here, and I just got their lead singer busted. Ipso facto, I'm toast. It will be okay. You guys hungry? I may never eat again. Good night. Miraculously, the sun came up in the morning, and Pat got a call from the guys in the group that was anything but gloomy. Larry had given them ten hours of free recording time in gratitude for Pat's help, and there was talk all over town about the voice from Mud Shark stomping out Sleeps with Fishes. Hardly an accurate account of the night's events, but my boy was well on his way to legendary status. Hey, he wore it well. The sessions were getting hot. Not bad at all. That's a new one, eh? Hot off the grill. Yeah, that's terrific. What's it called? Fishy business. <laughs> Way cool, man. Thought you'd like it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Hey, it wasn't that good, Larry. The sleeps with fishes, that is gone.
That tape represents the creative output of my band for the last eight months. That's right. And I was there with you every step of the way. You should have settled, not stolen the dad. We didn't need to steal the tape. It was my intellectual property. That's the legal term, eh? And my lawyer got a court order to that effect this morning, which is why you faked the robbery. I didn't fake the robbery. I would have fought that order and won. Right, Sergeant? Uh, look, i got to fill out this report, so... Can anybody tell me what the tape was actually worth? Millions. If it was a hit. You know it was going to be a hit. That's why you were holding us up. Nobody knows what's going to hit money. And the odds are more than excellent that you are a flash in the pan. What did Metro Insurance say, Marty? Uh, yeah, well, I talked to Bruce about it. There are industry standards for this kind of claim, and, um... Basically, what you're looking at is replacement value. Replacement value? Metro will reimburse Music Mart and or Sleeps with Fishes for the cost of materials and studio time. And that's it? Afraid so. Such is art. No way! Oh, man, this is nuts. I put my life into that tape. Then why didn't you back it up? You were trying to dump me. I'm out of here. Can we go now? For the time being. Didn't you hear what I just said? We were going to get the dat back legally, so we had no motive for taking it. Hey, my job's to come up with a motive. Your job is to come up with an alibi. You come up with the time the tape was stolen, we'll come up with an alibi. In the meantime, Mel's got to rehearse. Right, lady? Lady, Jesus, Eric. Sorry. Chill, and we're out of here. This time, call my lawyer. Damn. Why do I get a ticket every time I park outside the police station? Well, it's either a fascist plot or this 15-minute zone. This 15-minute zone is a fascist plot. So, Sherlock, who did it? Hard to say. Everybody's a suspect and there are no clues. There is a possibility that this wasn't plain old B&E. No sign of forced entry. Now, how did you read this last scene in the police station? Nobody looked particularly happy when you told them about the insurance, did they? Nope. Was that story the truth, or did you just make it up to get a reaction? Well, unfortunately, it's the truth. Heads up. Incoming at 5 o'clock. Hi, Pat. Uh, hi. Uh, I've been thinking about you a lot. We were way out of line the other night, and no hard feelings, okay? Sure. Right. I hope you didn't hurt your axe on my head. You kidding? Those old strats are solid, Mick? Yeah, and so is my head. <laughs> I, uh, play an old strat, too. You play? Sure. Just not good enough, right, Mel? Later, Eric. Anyway, we're both sorry for what happened, so I've been thinking. We're playing the jam at the Blackbird tomorrow afternoon, all ages. You want to sit in? You mean it? Why not? You play okay. See ya. Jam with sleeps with fishes. Yes! got an investigation that's nothing but dead ends, you go back to the basics. First rule, work your contacts. Billy Saunders is not your average snitch. In fact, he's a senior VP at Burgess Developments. Burgess builds most of the towers that blot out the view of the harbor from Citadel Hill. And over the last 15 years, Billy's fortunes rose with the company. But he kept the street credibility intact, running half a dozen youth programs around the hood. If you really need information, he can get it for you. I asked around. It's none of the regulars. See, Larry gives free studio time to some of the brothers. That makes him a hero on the street. He's also got bars on every window in the whole damn building. Now, Ash thinks Larry stole the tape from himself because Sleeps with Fishes were getting a court order on him. Well, that is one theory. Makes sense. He was already ripping them off for their music. Maybe, but the music mark was hardly an impregnable fortress. According to the claims files at Metro, he's had three robberies in five years. Larry keeps the doors locked, but every time he needs a coffee or a burger, he tosses the keys to the nearest kid. One of them could have had a spare key cut easy. Which is what Eric must have done. Why blame Eric? He walked in on your session, right? And I saw Larry lock the doors before you started. That just proves my theory. If he had a key, anybody could have one. And it still doesn't make any sense for him and Mel to have pulled the robbery. Why pay their lawyer if they plan to steal the tape back? To cover their play. What do we know about this kid, anyway? Kid? Well, Eric grew up on Brunswick Street. 
He's been in and out of trouble most of his life. Small-time stuff. The occasional brawl. He's a real scrapper with a vindictive side. Father was a real son of a bitch. Longshoreman drunk. Beat up on the mother. He was real lucky to get himself out. Get himself out? Yeah, same as you. Got into Dow on a transition year program, but he dropped out to work with the band. And Melanie Ash. She's classic. Dad owns a concrete company, serious party connections. She's Halifax Grammar School from the get-go. Dressing down, huh? She's a brilliant songwriter, Dad. Her and Eric. That's strange, Brew, eh? Mm, you know how it goes. The South End brats adopt the kids with dirt under the fingernails. Sounds familiar. They didn't do it. If it's not the kids off the street, it's Larry, and that's obvious. I just don't believe he did it. You'd rather blame it on Generation Y. Typical! I keep forgetting how young my son really is. Oh, he talks like a grown-up. Demands to be treated like a grown-up. But mostly he's still just a kid. One little invitation to jam and his whole perspective on the case shifts. Mel and Eric are suddenly rebels with the cause and Larry is scum. I didn't want to think about how Sharon would handle her son playing with pistol-packing psychos in plaid shirts, but I was about to find out. Not a chance. Mom! No! And that's final. Fine. Good night. Ouch. Something tells me we haven't heard the last of this one. You want him to go? Well, not really, no, but this is a chance to play with the hottest band in town. He will go unless we chain him to the wall. Sounds like a perfectly good idea to me. Look, it's a Saturday afternoon gig. We'll go with him. It's a date. And I feel the headache coming on already. The Blackbird is huge. The basement floor of a grim-looking mid-60s industrial bunker. A kind of gut-wrenching development that made certain stretches of downtown Halifax look like modern-day Moscow. Ugly, stupid, and a big enough commercial failure to make the rent almost attractive. The Blackbird packed them in, even on a Saturday afternoon when the bar was closed. And the crowd very young indeed. Except for me, Sharon, and Larry. You do the all-ages shows a lot? Only when the police are searching my apartment. That McNeil's a real piece of work. Is the tape there? I don't know where the tape is. Damn it all, Marty. I thought at least you'd believe me. Well, I do. But Eric and Mel don't work as suspects either. Eric and Mel. A couple made in hell if I ever saw one. Is there a number? Used to be. Until she decided trad relationships were part of the big problem. There's Pat! Raven hair and temper. The buzzes round her head like flies. Never. Her money can't buy her lies. Never. Things go wrong. Veronica fight back. Veronica never cries. And Betty, 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 Betty always dies. Sleeps with fishes was nothing if they weren't loud. We all stood there surrounded by slowly gyrating kids watching as Pat let go with everything he had. And they loved it. Then Pat stood forward, big grin on his face, about to add a harmony to Mel's vocal. He leaned into the mic and... A charge shot between the mic and Pat's lips, down his arm and into the guitar strap across his chest. He stiffened, trembled, was held suspended for a split second, and then flew across the stage like a broken doll. Let us through. I'm his father. Let us... Police, clear Pat. Pat, Pat are Pat. you okay? Dad. Dad, you should have known. I should have... Look, before it went on, I found the tape. In my guitar case. What? Yeah. Wreck. All screwed up, Dad. There were clues. You were just too old. Pat. Patty. Call an ambulance. Now! We found the dot in Pat's guitar case, just like he said. A cracked shell and not a tape. There were clues. You were just too old. Too old for what? Everybody had motivation for a theft. But it was no good to anybody if it was destroyed. And planting it in Pat's case made absolutely no sense. Nothing made sense. At least nothing made business sense. So what had an old guy like me forgotten about? Sharon went in the ambulance and I stayed behind. What were the clues I had failed to see? 
you'll be okay, Marty. He said, you're just too old to understand. What did he mean by that? The other day I joked that I didn't get the grunge thing. He said, aren't you a bit old to get into passion? That's the punchline? You bet. See, there's so much money tied up with this case, that's all we've ever focused on. Twenty years a cop, you think I'd know better. Hey, I'm coming up on thirty years, I still don't get it. This is a crime of passion. That's absurd. I don't think so. It doesn't make any sense for Eric to destroy eight months of our work. No, eight months of your work. He was just along for the ride. Well, you're wrong. He's... How long have you been kicking that kid in the teeth, Mel? What are you talking about? He was your first guitar player, wasn't he? Yeah, You but... threw him out of the band. He wasn't good enough. He understood that. Did he? You've never heard him play. Larry told me. He sucks. Replace him. And he was right. I did. And we haven't looked back. Guess Eric's just so in love with you, he'd put up with anything. Look, we used to have a relationship, but we outgrew it. It was a mutual thing. Sure it was. Emotional suffering really turns your creative crank, does it? If I didn't care for Eric, I wouldn't have kept him around. Not after he got strung out. I tried to get him to seek help. Right. And kept slipping him fifties. I owed him. Really? I thought he was just some tough little North End kid you could use to prove how liberal you were to all your South End fans. Look, just leave me alone. Hey, my son has passed out in an ambulance headed for the hospital and your boyfriend did it. Pat will be okay. Maybe you can protect him this time, Mel. But how about the next kid who gets in his way? How about the next time he destroys your intellectual property because you care more about your music than you do about him? He's just mixed up right now. No, he's dangerous. And you know it. Okay. Okay, I saw Eric in the dressing room. He had Pat's guitar case open and he was working on the cord. But instrument maintenance is part of his job. I didn't think... No. You were too busy thinking about yourself. We found Eric out in the loading dock humping gear. The show was over, but the roadies still had work to do. Some things never change, even in rock and roll. Eric, I need to talk to you. What now? Don't you even want to know how Pat is? He'll be okay. What makes you so sure? Hey, the crummy gear everybody uses around here? Getting that kind of shock happens all the time. But that kind of shock... Sometimes he can kill you, right? Like that guy from Stone the Crows? Before my time. Bullshit. Every roadie in the world knows how a guitar player can get electrocuted. Easy, Marty. He stole that tape, destroyed it, and planted it in my son's guitar case. No way. Anybody could have taken that tape. It wasn't anybody. It was you. You can't prove that. We can prove you disconnected the grounds of my son's guitar and that mic he was using. No way. We've got your fingerprints on the inside of the mic housing. So what? I'm the roadie. It's part of my job to maintain the gear. But you were messing with his guitar, too, Eric. I saw you. Mel. You tried to kill him, Eric. Why? I know why. Because he's a kid from the wrong side of the track, same as me. I understand, Eric. She gives you a kind of hope, right? Makes you believe you can be something better, then she snatches it away. And you couldn't handle it, could you, Eric? Yes. No. I did it for her. She needed me back in the band. The dat. All the stuff they recorded without me was crap, and she knew it. Deep down. That's why I really wrecked the tape for her. I did it for you. And that was that. Mel got her tape, but it was worthless. Larry got squat. And Eric? I was guessing five to ten at Dorchester. I left Denny to tie up the loose ends and hurry down to the hospital. Sharon was sitting by Pat's bed stroking his head the way she used to when he was five and had the flu. I sat with him. Guess I gave her the details I don't remember. All I remember is the hum of fluorescent lights and the sound of my son breathing. Then he groaned and slowly opened his eyes. How you feeling, Elvis? Uh-huh. Huh? You get Eric? Yeah. Good. Didn't know you'd understand. Oh, I got it loud and clear. But after you found that tape in your case, you should have come to see me right away. You were just about to go on, and I didn't think... 
Obviously. If you ever pull anything that boneheaded again, I'll kill you myself. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mom. I just... I know I screwed up, but... Look, you aren't a detective or a rock star. You are a wise-ass 16-year-old who thinks he's a lot older than he really is. I think it's time you got grounded. Grounded? Yeah. For the first month after you get out of this place, any guitar playing better be classical and it better be scales. Right? Yeah. Okay. I love you, Mom. Hey, Mom? Yeah? If I'd been grounded on stage, none of this would have happened. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Just heard Sleeps with Fishes by Paul Adu, the latest episode of his series In the Blood. Featured in the cast today, Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, Jennifer Overton as his wife Sharon, Brad Kennedy as Pat, John Fulton as Denny McNeil, Joanne Miller as Melanie Ash, Sean Jollymore as Eric Cole, John Dunsworth as Larry Staples, and George Boyd as Billy Saunders. The music was by Dave Burton. The recording engineer was Pat Martin. Sound effects by Dermot Kenny. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The associate producer was Peggy Hemsworth. The program was produced and directed in Halifax by our executive producer, Bill Howell. Hi gang, Bob Boving here with The Mystery Project. And tonight, the latest installment of In the Blood by Paul Ledoux. An almost forgotten love interest. A drug peddler found murdered. An arrested addict. And all this before they call lunch. This isn't what Marty Carlin's horoscope promised for the day. There should at least have been a warning about venturing into deep water. In the Blood, Episode 6, Needles, Fingers, and Arms. Starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin. A small-time insurance investigator is discovered dead at his desk. There's no evidence of foul play, but the mysterious nature of his passing leads his boss to send for an investigator from the head office. He discovers that the dead man's family life is idyllic. His wife, a loving companion, comes from an extremely wealthy family, and the deceased has many friends and no apparent enemies. The pro is stumped. Until he examines the dead man's files, a nearly bottomless pile of paperwork that reveals absolutely nothing of interest. Dull investigation follows dull investigation with stupefying regularity. Bicycle theft is a big deal in the dead man's working life. After two days, the world-weary investigator goes to see his boss. He believes he solved the mystery. The man has simply died of boredom. I could identify with that corpse. The alarm went off at 7, Halifax time, same as always. I got up, staggered to the bathroom and tested my blood. 12.8, not good. I swore for the hundredth time to lay off potato chips, injected a dose of insulin, showered, shaved, pounded on my son Pat's door, went downstairs and got the coffee going. 7.15. My wife Sharon hit the main floor straightening her power suit and moving with the efficiency she'd been pumping ever since she took over her daddy's TV station. Morning, babe. Did I remember to tell you I won't be home for supper? No problemo. I'm getting very proficient at burning hamburgers. What's up? A uh, focus session with the news department. Last night, we were scooped by the Comical Herald. Say, it ain't so. A drug dealer, Earl Zink, got murdered up on Gottagen Street. Talk about stupid. The shooter took a taxi to Zink's place, told the cabbie to wait, went in, blew the guy away, came out and got the hack to drive him home. And what was our lead story last night? Mime's triumph at Busker Fest. That's five drug-related killings in the last six months. Getting as bad as T.O., look. We're practically the murder capital of Canada, and CJNS is covering white-faced jugglers. God. The guy they busted for the shooting. Lou Dickens? He used to play harp for the A1 Blues Band. 
Well, I guess he blew it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, look at the time. Can you drop Pat at summer school? I can't afford to be late today. Sure, nothing going on at work that won't wait. Be home by ten, I hope. You know, I can almost relate to Dickens. It's impossible to flag down a cab in this town. Pat was late, and so was I. But when I walked into the offices at Metro Insurance at 9.45, nobody seemed to notice or care. I poured a coffee, booted up the computer, and checked the machine. Marty, it's Maggie. Long time no see, eh? Listen, Marty, uh, I got trouble. Haul your ass over here, will ya? 2390 Garrick. Brown back. Marguerite LeBlanc was the kind of big-boned redhead could drink under the table or keep you up all night long. But Maggie had a weakness for bikers, blues, and speed. Back when we were together, I always figured she'd come down, realize who she was living with, and chuck me out. Turned out she stuck with me, till the day I left her a note in Blue Town. I hadn't seen her in 15 years. I had to call her back. Marty, give me some. Hey. (laughs) So, how you doing, Martin? Not as bad as I look. You, you're still the same. No way, man. Check the new Black Sabbath t-shirt. Oh, hell, I just put her down. I'll be back. I looked around the low-ceilinged, run-down old apartment. The whole place sat on a crazy tilt. A souvenir of the Halifax explosion. Squeaks on the floor, incense, and Mexican black bean soup covering the odor of dry rot and crumbling plaster. Funny. It felt like coming home. So what's this all about, Maggie? All about? You read the papers, don't you? Lou? I'm married to him. Mrs. Dukas. They left that part out. (laughs) Well, I did chuck him out just after the second bundle of joy came along. So, you're separated. Why the worried call? Jesus, Marty. He's the father of my kids. And he may be a junkie, but he's no killer. And who did it? That's what you have to find out. It's called legwork. Door to door, street corner to street corner. Asking all the right questions to all the wrong people until something breaks loose. I worked the four blocks around Earl Zink's place for the next six hours. Not expecting to turn up much real fast. But hey, I was wrong. By five, I was on my way to the cop shop to talk to my old friend and mentor, Sergeant Denny McNeil. I got a wino who says he heard a shot after Lou left, and a crackhead who says he saw somebody peek out through the blinds. Not real credible witnesses. Maybe not the wino, but I've got a 70-year-old church lady who backs up the other guy. The police didn't interview one person on that entire block. Well, the taxi driver's statement was solid, and her ride log backs her up on the times. It's still very sloppy police work. What's it to you, anyway? Maggie asked me to help. You remember... Maggie? Have you been seeing Maggie? Seeing Maggie? You mean... (laughs) No. Denny, I'm a very married individual. I remember you and that girl... She had you wrapped around her finger like a rubber band. Twenty years ago. Look, I've got three witnesses. That's enough to get them out. Just point me in the right direction. Okay, but Lou Dickens is a long-term habitual offender. The boys down here dislike him profoundly. So I take what you've got to his lawyer. Fine. And who might that be? Harry White. Harry White started his career defending dime bag drug dealers. It was a growth industry in the late 60s, and he loved it, almost as much as he dug the blues. Harry came on like he was F. Lee Bailey, a backroom wheeler dealer of the first order. He affected loud bow ties in a florid manner. Old family, good library, careful money. I always figured he was too big a jerk to ever make it, but I was wrong. He became one of Halifax's top corporate lawyers, and from what I heard, He hadn't touched a criminal case in ten years. But then, he and Lou went back. He'd been a fan. White wasn't at his office when I called, but they told me where to find him. An unlikely waterfront tavern frequented by wharf frats, like my old pal, Freddy Ferret. Harry was parked in a stool near the poker machine, studying the gamblers. 
The bow tie was pure silk, flashier than ever. The new toupee was stunning. Martin, a delight, fascinating, this. They stand their eyes dead, pumping dollar after dollar into those machines. Driven, a hopeless dream of wealth, or just a biochemical reaction. Repetitive motion, video stimulation, the rush of anticipated victory, the release of defeat, the sharp, pleasure-filled surge of endorphins, highly addictive and delicious. You're a poet, Harry. Alas, if only it was so. Maggie Dickens called me. Lou's case? Ah, yes. A tragic accident that was in many ways the fault of the victim. After all, zinc supplied the monkey on my client's back. Sympathetic physicians will testify on Lou's behalf. I'll arrange a brilliant plea bargain. He'll do six years maximum. I think he can get him off. I would that I could, but I'm afraid the caddy's testimony is quite convincing and unequivocal. Ah, oh, the hell with you, you stupid... What do you want, Winky? The simple joy of your company would suffice. Martin, meet Katie the cabbie, urban transport, private sector, a noble profession I avail myself of often since my unfortunate Yuletide run-in with the ride program. Could I impose upon you to repeat your tale of woe for my good friend Martin? Instant replay? Ah, uh, why not? I drove blue to Zinks. He told me to wait. I did. Then I heard something going pop, like a gun. And Lou, he comes out and we drive away. When I heard about the shooting on the radio, I realized what he'd gone down and I phoned the cops. That's it. End of story. Not quite. Take a look at these, Harry. Depositions? For me. Delighted. Hmm. Delightful. Katie. The police case hinges on your credibility, and we now have three happy campers with a different tale to tell. Have you ever been charged with perjury? The that nasty you? bit of business that I'm out of order. The two of us discussing your perjury charge. Quite unseemly. Let's say no more. I must be off, Martin. I'll arrange for a short meeting with Judge Brennan, present your depositions, and then, no doubt, I'll be picking up my client in Sacro. Merci, and adieu. Damn it all, Wiggy. You come back here. I ain't doing no perjury rap. Wiggy. Katie, I've got a few questions that might... Forget it. I'm not talking to nobody, especially you. I'm gone, Freddy. See you, Katie. Jeez, Carl. What'd you do to her? Ask her to marry you? If some hood tried to get away with what I just saw, they'd call it tampering with a witness. But Harry would play it as a chance encounter, one of our finer bistros. And he'd get away with it, too. Funny. The sick taste Harry always left in the back of your throat. Call it a night, Pat. Your mom just pulled in the yard. You're late. Not too late for the CJNS news at 11. I'm telling you, he didn't do it. But you admit he's a heroin addict. Not exactly. A state secret. And Earl Zink was a known trafficker. Don't you think that gives your husband a motive? Get out of my way before I take that mic and shove it where the sun don't shine. What in hell was that all about? Well, that's Mrs. Dickens. Caught her picking her son up at school. Does the senator's daughter kick butt or what? Or what? You remember Maggie? Your first big love? That's Maggie. That's Maggie? Oh, you never told me about the tattoos or the stevedore's mouth. If some news team bushwhacked you in front of Pat's school, you'd kick him to death. My husband isn't a junkie who shot his dealer. I doubt if the issue will come up. But Lou's innocent. What? I found three witnesses saw someone move inside Zinks after Lou left. You found three witnesses? Maggie called the office and asked me to help. I did. Lou should be out by now. Really? Give me Monroe. Phil, on the zinc case? Dickens is being released. I want a mobile unit at his place now. And if he's not there, get to the wife. Thanks for the scoop. Sharon, what the hell is wrong with you? What's the matter? If he's not there, get to the wife. Where are you going? To look for another ambulance for you to chase. Martin. I need to talk. Come in. Hey, 
catch me on the news? Yeah. That's better. I got tequila. No. Ah, uh, sure. What the hell? Mm -hmm. So Lou been around? Very funny. No, no joke. I found him an alibi, and Harry sprung him. Harry White? You sound like you didn't hire him. <laughs> If Harry White was dying in the street, I'd step over him and keep going. How come? About two years ago, Lou got himself clean. He put together a group. They were hot. Remember how White used to hang out at Sullivan's? Lou's biggest fan. So now Lou wants to make a record. He goes to White, asks him to invest in studio time. And White turned him down. Are you kidding? Jumped in with both feet. Lou starts laying down tracks. Everything's great, I think. Then one day I find a bent spoon and a set of works. Turns out Harry likes chipping a bit of H with his musicians. And he gets Lou wasted again. The sessions are a bust, and I chuck Lou out. The rest, as they say, is history. Cheers. You're saying that one of the most prominent lawyers in town is a junkie? And half the South End knows it, too. And how does he get away with it? Things haven't changed all that much since you went away, Martin. A South End lawyer can get away with murder, as long as he doesn't embarrass anybody at the Yacht Squadron. Right? Right. What are you doing here at midnight, anyway? I told Sharon Lou had been released. She put a mobile unit on the prowl. I wanted to warn you they might show. Thanks. I'm just glad I could help. You ever get scared, Marty? Huh? I get scared sometimes. That's a laugh, huh? Me scared? Yeah. Good night, Maggie. Ever wonder what would have happened with us? Sometimes. You sure you've got to go? Yeah. Night, Maggie. I drove around a while to clear my head. I got again to Myrtle Street. Past the old hydrostone apartment I grew up in, back down Barrington, lost in memories and thoughts about how things might have been if I hadn't run away. After a long time, I realized I needed something in my stomach. Drove to the Paradise, but the place was gone. I needed something, but I couldn't remember where to go. I pulled over on Hollis and tried to think, but I couldn't remember. I couldn't even remember what I was supposed to be trying to remember, and I was tired. So tired. I came to in the emergency room with Denny and Sharon staring down at me. What happened? You didn't come home. I got scared, so I called Denny. The boys found you on Hollis Street. Doctor says you had another diabetic attack. How are you feeling? Fine. Yeah, they said you'd be fine. They just have to give you a quick check, and you can come home. Sorry, I got to go to work. I've got these reports. If they don't go in We today, phoned Bruce. He says it's okay. It's not okay. Not if I'm fine. Did your guys find Lou last night? No. Nobody's seen Dickens since White got him out. Marty, wait. Marty, the guys in the mobile unit—they saw you coming out of Maggie's place last night. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Where's the doctor? I should have gone home, but I wasn't ready to have that conversation with Sharon about Maggie and what she said and how it made me feel. It confused me, and I had to think it through. The message light on my machine was blinking when I walked through the office door. Marty, it's eight forty-five. Phone me. Marty, five after nine. Phone me as soon as you get in, Marty. It's ten o'clock. Where in hell are you? Ten fifteen, Marty. Here it is. I got a call from Lou. He said some stuff on the phone. He's scared, Marty. Wants to meet me at eleven. There was no answer, so I kicked in the door. Maggie was gone. No note. Nothing to tell me where she was meeting Lou. 
So I phoned Maritime Tell and Tell. Yeah, this is Sergeant Denny McNeil, Halifax Police. I need the details of all calls in on this line over the past 12 hours. Look, this is an emergency. My badge number is 33356. Do it. I got the list of numbers and names to go with them. Then I made one more call to Freddie Ferret. Jeez, Colin. How come every time you got a problem, you call me? Hey, that's what friends are for, Freddie. And there's a nice 50 in it for you. Okay, okay. You got it right. Katie and Harry White are pals like. She's practically a chauffeur. Phones are special every time he wants a cab. Tips are from a roll of loonies. Katie's got a bad for the slots, huh? Yeah? How bad? Real bad. She's so far behind in the payments, they're going to repossess her cab. Thanks, Freddy. That's all I need to know. Great. So when do I get my 50 bucks? Harry White lived in a modest little Tudor by the tennis court mansion overlooking the arm. No car in the driveway, but then Harry had lost his license, so he didn't need one. Harry didn't actually need much of anything, except an alibi. Why, Martin? To what do I owe the pleasure? Where's Lou? I haven't seen him since I procured his release. Funny. He called Maggie from here this morning. Oh, very well, then. Given the intense media scrutiny placed on this case, I thought it best to offer him shelter from the storm. But he has departed. Yeah? Too bad. I was hoping he'd tell me what you were doing at Earl Zink's when he was killed. And what makes you think I was there? I worked it out. Katie was driving Lou, so you couldn't use her. You can't flag a cab in Gottingham. And you can't phone for a pickup after you shoot Zink. So I checked the casino taxi stand up the road. The dispatcher remembered your bow tie and had the log for the ride. Pickup time and destination. 5672 Armdale Crescent. And here you are. Ah. Well, maybe you should come in. It is possible I was just in the neighborhood, you know. No proof otherwise. You want to roll up those French cuffs, show me your arms, and tell me that again? My medical problem is none of your concern. Danny McNeil would call it a motive. Makes no sense, Martin. Why would I kill my supplier, assuming this zinc was as such? Do you also have a way of going sour? Maybe the guy tried to rip you off. Then you popped him. Why me? Why not Lou? A shot was fired after he left, remember? But Lou was too well known in the neighborhood to come and go undetected. So you call Katie, who'd given him the lift home. You know she's about to lose her cab, so you write her a check and she tells the story the way you want it told. How am I doing? An amusing fiction. But why would Luke cover for me? In his position, I'd certainly spill the beans. And the police would certainly take you at your word. A big-time self-end lawyer, right? But who's going to believe a three-time loser like Lou? His only hope is that you'll cut a deal that'll protect you both. You'll do the time, you'll make it worth his while. Everything is perfect until... You come up with an alibi for Lou forcing me to play out of that charade with Katie at the tavern. No big deal. But Lou in the clear was something else. The police would have to start a real investigation, maybe put things together like I did. Proof, 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 Martin. These wild suppositions simply won't hold up in a court of law. Maybe not. But if I'm right, and we both know I am, then Lou's a terrible liability. So I want to see him. Just to make sure he's still alive. You have a total and absolute lack of insight into my relationship with my great friend, Lou. Where is he, Harry? He's been shooting up. On the couch. Lou. You okay, man? Lou. He's OD'd. Oh, my God. I'll call an ambulance. I listened for a heartbeat. It was there, slow, far away and failing. Come on, Lou. Wake up. Lou, come on, man. I'm afraid you're wasting your time, Martin. No one turns that blue and survives. I said call the... Ambulance? Oh. You've noticed the gun in my hand. I don't really have to point it at you, do I? I prefer you didn't. Sorry. No one home. Lou? Lou, you here? No. Oh. I left the door unlocked. In here, Maggie. Harry? I'm looking for... Uh, Blake turned to cover Maggie. I dove at him. Got his arm up, tried to shake the gun loose, but he wasn't letting go. Maggie, get down! Drop the gun! 
dropped the friggin' gun! My arm! You broke my arm! You shut your face before I break your neck, Maggie. Oh, the bastard shot me, Marty. Easy, Maggie. I'll be okay. What about Lou? He's dead. following Mr. White's activities with concern for some time, but he's a prominent member of the Nova Scotia Bar, so naturally... So lawyers receive special treatment in Halifax. When a suspect knows as much about the law as Mr. White, you tread real careful. That's all. The accused, Harry White, would agree. In court today, he announced his intention to conduct his own defense and was released into the custody of the Colchester Addiction Research Center where he will receive treatment for what White describes as a medical problem. The very concept that I'm responsible for the death of Mr. Zink is patently absurd, and the heroin-induced overdose of my client Lou Dickens merely underlines the tragedy of drug addiction in our society, a tragedy of which I myself am a victim. So you're innocent? Absolutely. So you deny shooting Marguerite LeBlanc? An accident. She and her boyfriend, Martin Carlin, broke into my abode. Yes, you heard me correctly. Her boyfriend, Martin Carlin, husband of your station manager. Everybody knows about Marty and Maggie. They broke into my house and assaulted me. I drew my weapon in self-defense, and he broke my arm. The weapon discharged accidentally, and I'll prove it. In a court of law, you have my word on that. My word. Martin Carlin will pay for this grievously. Turn it off. If he thinks he'll get away with this, he's crazy. Yeah, he's that, all right. But he might have pulled it off. With Lou dead from an OD, White could tell the police he confessed. They'd have bought it, same as always. Maybe. Did she go there with you, Marty? No. Lou told her he was at Harry's. When he didn't show up for the meeting, she went looking for him. Lucky for me. You been to see her yet? In the hospital? Yeah. She'll be fine. Like she said. I'm jealous. What? I'm afraid of that woman, Marty. Afraid of how you talk about her. Afraid of how she makes you feel. I don't know how she makes you feel. Hey, you're my wife. I love you. And there's nothing going on with Maggie, Sharon. Then come here and prove it. was episode six of In the Blood by Paul Ledoux, starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin. Others in the cast were Jennifer Overton as Sharon, Caitlin Calhoun as Maggie, John Fulton as Denny McNeil, Leon Ponnell as Harry White, Linda Busby as Katie, Lori LaViolette as Freddie Ferret, and Betsy Keating as the reporter. The music was by Dave Burton. The recording engineers were Pat Barton and John McCarthy, with sound effects by Dermot Kenny and Anton Zabo. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The associate producer was Peggy Hemsworth. The play was produced and directed in our Halifax studios by the executive producer of The Mystery Project, Bill Howell. I'm Bob Bobing, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. Hi, gang. Bob Bobing here for The Mystery Project. This week, we're at Episode 7 of Paul Ledoux's series, In the Blood. Marty Carlin, ex-police detective and his family, have returned to Halifax after years away in Toronto. Now an insurance investigator, Carlin finds that his old-time connections can lead him into major trouble. Labor Dispute Becomes Labor Destruction in Alternate Catches, starring Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin. 
Not bad. 240 yards. Easy. Right, John? Yeah. Too bad about the hook, eh, Bruce? Yeah. Too bad about the lake, too. <laughs> you guys leave me alone. Golf is still a new brand of punishment. Oh, I'm sorry. I told him not to. No, oh. no, it's mine. Burgess? Yeah? Just a sec. Sorry, my fish processing plant in Cap St. Luke. Yeah, go ahead. Geez, I knew his construction business was booming, but a fish processing plant? Fish processing plants. Ray's been a buyer for years. What? How bad? Okay, yeah. So, another fishy business, eh, Ray? <laughs> you okay? There's been an explosion. The man was hurt. How bad? Critical condition. It was a bomb. <laughs> Like the view, Marty? Kind of hard to hear yourself think. Yeah, but we'll be in St. Luke in 45 minutes instead of three hours. Yeah, if we don't crash. What's the trouble at the plant all about, anyway? It's complicated. The Camp St. Luke plant has been shaky since the collapse of the ground fishery. So I cut a deal with the province. I bought in, and they financed me to retool for alternative catches. We're processing crab, scallops, and shrimp. I was turning things around until the feds decided to reduce local quotas. I'm losing money, big time. So what's the bottom line? I've got no choice. I'm closing down and moving the capital assets to my sheet harbor plant. The locals hate the idea. They think a bigot line will stop you? It might. The local MLA has been raising hell in the legislature. I promised to keep Cap St. Luke going, and the province invested heavily in the new equipment. If the Fisherman's Union can keep the heat on, I won't be able to get my gear out. That's nuts. You own it. Maybe. But we're talking politics, not property law. These guys still resent the English from Halifax telling them what to do, eh? <laughs> Think they'd be used to it after 250 years. The English had tried hard to run the Acadians out of Nova Scotia, but it didn't quite take. Cap St. Luke was a fishing community near Yarmouth with one of those huge Catholic churches to prove the point. Ray landed in the harbor and ran his seaplane up to the government wharf. Gerard Blinn, the plant manager, was waiting for us. I watched Blinn as I untangled my stomach. Classic chiseled Acadian features, tall, jet black hair, a beard that was too carefully trimmed. He was nervous from the moment he caught the mooring rope. Ray grabbed the front seat in Lynn's car and hit the cell phone while we drove to the plant. Yeah, Burgess. I don't know if we can get past the pickets. Last week they flipped yeah, the pickup, yeah. and when they see Mr. Burgess, uh, this is kind of scary. These are all good people, but Jack LeBlanc got them so worked up, even this explosion hasn't stopped them. I still can't believe it. Who is Jack LeBlanc? He's a fisheries union organizer. Local boy makes good. You know the type. Comes home after 20 years away and... First thing, start telling everybody what to do. Okay. Thanks, Hank. Call you back. Jim Jodry is dead. He's dead? The guy in the bobbing? That's right. One of those fishermen is now a killer. The fishermen were still milling around outside the fish plant as we rolled through dead silence. They looked terrified. Chief Thompson was a small town cop in a community that should have been served by the RCMP. I wasn't impressed. So, what do you got? Uh, Mr. Blinn got a package this morning. The Mounties think it was a letter bomb. I put it on top of the computer. Meant to open it, but there was a rocket at the gate and... I'm doing my best, but they're getting worse every day. We should have a forensic profile on the explosion by tonight. Yeah, right. What about Jodry? He management? Uh, no. He was from unemployment insurance. Just down for the morning. A routine inspection of our records. And those SOBs out there killed him. You sure it was one of them? Has to be. It's been building up for weeks. 
Two days ago, they threw a bottle full of burning gas at the front of my house. And now an innocent man is dead. Perfect. Mr. LeBlanc, I expect Chief Thompson wants to talk to you. Uh, yeah. Look, I sent the guys home. I just figured... What exactly happened in here, anyway? You tell us. Was it some idiot you whipped into a lather? Or did you mail the bomb yourself? Look, Burgess, you think you can get away with making unsubstantiated accusations like that, then you've got another... We just need to ask you some questions. Ask some questions. Sure thing. Anything you can pin on labor, staple it down, right? Okay. We can talk. Some place that doesn't stink of fish. Thompson and LeBlanc went down to the cop shop. I interviewed the few people still working in the plant. It was routine. No results. Five o'clock, Ray said, let's knock off. He wanted me to stay with him and Bruce out at his beach house. I told them I had to be in town. There was no chance of solving the case driving around with the boss. Ray said fine and loaned me the company in Trepid. I checked into a motel and went to the tavern for a steak. In a town like Cal St. Luke, if you have questions you need answered, the tavern is the place to start. Joe's tavern was a functional place in a low brick building. Big parking lot. No class. I walked in through the heavy wooden doors. And... Charlotte! It's about time you showed up. Maggie? What in hell are you doing here? I came to visit my brother. I'm from here, remember? Marguerite LeBlanc was an old girlfriend and an even older friend. She'd suddenly become part of my life again. Maggie always reminded me of who I was and who I used to be. Get over here and give me some. Mm -hmm. So I heard you were in town and told my brother you'd show up here eventually. Come on, you two got to talk. Every eye in the place was on me as I followed Maggie across the tavern to a long table in the back where Jack LeBlanc sat, nursing a beer. So, you two have already met, right? <laughs> After a fashion. Pull up a chair, Marty. I would have introduced myself at the plant, but uh, not the time or the place, right? Right. Thanks. So, small world. Damn straight. Be back. Hey, Clarence, a tray of draft. So... I wasn't around when you and Maggie were an item, but she says you're a stand-up guy, and... And you want to talk to someone you can trust? I wouldn't mind. I think somebody is setting me up. For the bombing? Why? Are you vulnerable? Spent eight years as a hard rock miner out in B.C. Controlled blasts, a specialty. Once they find out, they'll be all over me. Maybe, but they'll still have to prove you did it. They don't have to prove it to discredit me. Everything we've tried to do here will go down the tubes. I'm hoping Thompson's so lame I can track down the real bomber before he finds out about B.C. Maggie says he'll help. Maybe. One of your guys sent the package? I don't know. I keep saying this is Nova Scotia, not Oklahoma, but... Who else had motive to go after Gerard? I don't know. But then, I don't know Gerard. <laughs> Gerard. He was never close to anybody. He was one of those kids could never get anybody to go over to his place unless he bought the pop. Started ordering suits from Boston when he was 16. The beer be here. Gerard was a company man even before he knew what a company man was. Come on, Jack. If Gerard hadn't been running the plant the last five years, a lot of guys would have suffered, and you know it. Okay. He used to take some chances and did some good. But he also sold us out to Burgess. What kind of chances does Gerard take? It wouldn't mean anything to you. Cheers. The steak was third rate and the conversation second hand. Fishermen kept glaring in my direction. All Jack would tell me was that he had no idea who the bomber could be or where to start looking for him. By last call, the whole exercise had degenerated into political diatribe. I mean, everybody's got motive, right? How long are we going to let the Burgesses of the world, the 5% who own everything, including our politicians, screw us? Jack, Marty doesn't need a lefty lecture. He used to be pretty good at them himself. See, the problem is, I've got to trust you before I can give you anything concrete. Jack, I said you didn't trust him. Yeah, and way back when you trusted him, he dumped you, didn't he? 
I never blamed him. And you don't know anything about it. You're right. Sorry. I'd better get out of here before I start breaking things, okay? See ya. Sorry, Marty. Ah, uh, that's okay. Can't blame him. He's inside a pressure cooker. Mm, I better get going, too. Yeah, come on. I'll walk you out. That's me, there. The intrepid. Oh, beautiful. What's the matter? Four splash tires, that's the matter. People around here have strange ways of making friends, Carolyn. Come on, I'll give you a lift. We drove back to the motel in silence, listening to Maggie's impossible old eight track. I should have felt uncomfortable. I didn't. Maggie always had the gift of easy silence, and I fell into it and into the music. We pulled into a parking lot full of 4x4s, festooned with TV news logos. All the major food groups were in attendance. CBC, CTV, CJNS. My, my, the vultures are circling. CJNS, too. Yeah, the family business. Bet Sharon's team got here first. You mean what you said back in the bar? About not blaming me for taking off? That was 20 years ago, Marty. I've been carrying it that long, too. Your best friend was dead. You blamed yourself and ran away. Like I said, I couldn't blame you. Hell, bud, we were children at the time. It would have never lasted anyway. Get out of here. The motel lot was dead quiet. The flicker of a TV screen in the occasional window. Nothing else. Then... Lights in every room in the motel snap on, and the doors smash open. A dozen people run out, among them my wife. Behind me I hear Maggie getting out of the car and realize how it looks. Marty, there's been another... Hey, guys, what in hell is going on? Marty, what in the hell is she doing here? I was at the tavern... No, I know you'll have a top-of-the-line story, and I want to believe it, but it's got to wait. There's been another explosion. At the plant? No, uh, one of the union guys. Um, 125 Old Shore Road? That's my brother's place. What happened? Oh, God, I'm sorry. I... Tell her, Marty, i got to go. All we know for sure is that there was an explosion in the boathouse, and Jack LeBlanc was down there. A building another bomb? We'll know more tomorrow. This is Sharon Carlin, CJNS News, in Cap St. Luke. Sharon. I'm busy. Barry, Look, I, I know how it must Get out seen... of my face, Marty, and let me do my job. Marty? Yeah. You okay? No. They say Jack was making a bomb. Crap. You sure, Maggie? Try this on instead. Gerard was banking stamps. Banking stamps? It's a pogey scam. When you run a fish plant, you can juggle the records so the fishermen you're buying from all get enough stamps to qualify for unemployment insurance. Gerard cooked his catch records to up the guy's UI? Yeah, but somebody must have ratted him out. The UI investigator would have caught him and everybody else. So who would have tipped UI? Ray. Turn in his own plant? Why? Once it got out, the poor fishermen who were getting all the sympathy in the legislature would be welfare bums, and Gerard would take the heat. Fine, but it doesn't matter, right? What's important is that every fisherman in town had reason to want Jodry out of the way. Except Jack. He's never drawn pogey in his life. So, whoever killed Jodry planted the second bomb to incriminate Jack? Do you think my brother would accidentally set off a charge? I don't. We'll know more. So you get your story? Yeah, I got my story. What's yours? Somebody slashed my tires at the tavern. She drove me home. That's all. I want to believe you, Marty, but... I can show you the car, Sharon. But either you believe me or you don't. If I didn't believe you, I wouldn't be here, right? Right. Okay. So, 
I found out Jack was an explosives expert. True. He told me that this afternoon. Oh, great. And what else do you know that I don't? There's a different angle. Gerard was banking new eye stamps for the whole fleet. So? That's traditional. Every fish buyer's sideline. Somebody turned him in. UI was investigating. Now, the records are gone, and so is the investigator. But the bomb was sent to Gerard. Right. By any one of a hundred fishermen with real motivation for destroying the catch records. Or Gerard mailed a bomb to himself to cover up. He knows when it's set to go off. Make sure he's outside. Kaboom. No investigator, no evidence? And no suspicion. If he can frame Jack and make sure he's not around to deny it. You buy it? The whole premise is far-fetched, but... But until you find out about the first bomb, you won't know one way or the other. So... So we phone Bruce and get the RCMP bomb report from Halifax. Now. Here. Yeah. Hi, Bruce. You awake? Uh, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Look, I'm sorry, but I need the lab report on the bomb at the plant now. And you'll have to pull official strings to get it. Now? But, uh, I mean, well, we heard from Thompson. Right? LeBlanc was the bad guy, right? If the first bomb was built by a pro. If not... Then we've got a crazy out there. I don't want a third explosion, Bruce. Trust me on this. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, get back to you as soon as I can. At the motel? Right. Thanks, Bruce. Man, I'm beat. Yeah, me too. We should get some sleep. Yeah. On the other hand, here we are in a strange motel a million miles from home. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Perfect. I'll get it. Yeah, what's... I don't believe it. I need Marty. Right. I'm Sharon, his wife. What's going on? Hey, no offense, but you're a journalist. No comment. Marty, we've got trouble. I'll be in my car. Sharon, I've got a case and she's part of it. Go on. We both have jobs to do. Couldn't sleep. Ended up out at the Fast and Tasty. Some of the fishermen were there. Pretty drunk. Bad mouthing Jack. I couldn't take it. Told them about the pokey investigation and blamed Ray. And they're going to talk to him. You called Thompson? I got an answering machine. Says he checks in every hour. Well, I was just talking to Bruce, and they haven't got to race place yet. Probably stopped at the bootleggers on the way. It was that kind of party. Listen, I'm sorry about snapping at your wife. Oh, forget it. You're under a lot of stress. Yeah. And jealous. She's got it all. Me. Yeah, disaster's been on my tail my whole life. You always gave more than you got, Maggie. You deserve better. <laughs> Damn right I do. But life ain't fair, you know? Hey, slow down. Guys like Ray never get lynched. No matter how much they deserve it. Cocktails, anyone? Not for me, thanks. We expected you'd have guests. The mini mom? Come and gone. Yeah, I don't think they expected to see Ray with a shotgun. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have another. Are you sure? Uh, we're fine. Right. So, the boys were rather angry. Maggie, I understand you identified me as the UI rat who wanted to do in the whole community. And Marty, you put her up to it? I thought we were friends. I told Maggie my theory, but it wasn't for public consumption. Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. You were right. I did phone UI. The fishermen are frauds. The management of the plant is corrupt. Once it's out in the open, I can close the whole mess, and who can blame me? Is that what you said to the guys? No. I denied any involvement. But you'll be happy to know I cleared your brother. I told him that the bomb at the plant was the work of an amateur. So you heard from the RCMP? Uh, yeah, the uh, RCMP lab analyzed fragments. Uh, melted bits of an old alarm clock, sticks of dynamite, real bush league. I phoned the motel and told Sharon... And I told the fisherman. Unfortunately, 
Gerard immediately fell under suspicion. You should have seen those guys pull out of here. Were they ever steamed? The crowd outside Gerard's was big and ugly and out of control. Thompson had turned out his entire force, three nervous guys in second-hand riot gear, all praying for reinforcements. Thompson, what the hell is... He's got a hostage. One of those Halifax TV types. She was in there doing an interview or something. Oh my God, Martin. Sharon? Put your rifles in the trunks of your cars and go home, okay? Go home and let the police take care of this. I told Maggie to get the bullhorn from Thompson and try to calm down her friend. Then I worked my way to a blind spot on the side of the house. I'm no kidding. Found an open basement window. You're an intelligent man, Gerard. You know you'll have to surrender eventually. All I ever wanted to do was to take care of this community. I wanted them to love me. And they did for a while. But things change. I couldn't help anymore. And then Jack came home, and they turned on me. He was sitting in the living room, a gun propped up beside him as he absently put the final touches on a brand new bomb. A long, slow moment, and then... Hey, Gerard, it's me. The cops say we can talk. You stay away from me, Maggie. Come on. You aren't going to shoot me, Gerard. What makes you so sure? Gerard sagged against the wall, sobbed, and slid to the floor. Oh, God, Jack. I'm sorry, Jack. <laughs> Suddenly, nothing made sense anymore, but there was no time to think. As he cried, Gerard softly laid his rifle down beside him. I slipped into the room. His head was buried in his hands as if he wasn't there at all. He was going for the gun when... Gerard, I want to trade. His eyes snapped open. He snatched the gun and suddenly I was standing there with a rifle pointed at my chest. Get back. Back. Okay. Okay. Easy. Gerard, that woman you got in there has nothing to do with it. Me for her, eh? Watch it. Watch. Damn it, Gerard. The door wasn't even locked. Those guys out there need business. And... Carlin? Just take it slow, Maggie. I didn't mean it. You've got to understand. It's okay. We understand. The bomb was Jack's idea, right? No. No, that's not what happened. It has to be, Maggie. Jack told me he and Gerard hardly knew each other. You just said they were best friends. There's only one reason for Jack to lie. He built the first bomb. Right, Gerard? He made it as cheap and stupid as he could. He said... They'll find out I'm a demolitions expert, so the bomb has to look amateur. He didn't want to hurt anybody, Maggie. It's just all went wrong. No, no. No, I don't believe it. I, I won't. I told Jack. You I know as I've been banking. They're sending someone. All Jack cared about was protecting the guys. He said, let him come. Won't matter. The records will be destroyed by the bomb. Jodry showed up a day early and started to download the files. I panicked, opened the parcel, reset the timer, then he should have been at lunch. The bomb should have gone off at 12.15. It was an accident. And the second bomb, the one that killed my brother, was that an accident too? It was murder. And I knew eventually he'd go to the police, so I, I watched him build the first bomb, just like this one. It's easy once you know how. Oh, God, I was so afraid, Maggie. It wasn't my fault. So, it's better if... Kill yourself, and no one will ever know the truth about Jack. And you end up just a grubby little murderer. But he's your brother. What would you want him to take the blame? I don't want him to take the blame. I want everybody to know the truth. And I'll make sure they hear it, Gerard. Okay. Gerard gave me his gun. Maggie started to cry, and it was Sharon who comforted her. Funny how things turn out, eh? The next morning, Ray called a press conference. The fact that Jodry and 
Jack were dead didn't seem to bother him much. After all, he'd won. Guess he couldn't afford to care. The shocking revelations concerning the long-term fraud at my plant and the tragic death that followed have reinforced my decision to close down operations here in Cap St. Luke. The Premier is in accord with my decision. Burgess just killed this community without even a blink. He's scum. I'm out of here. See ya. She's right. He is scum. Hey, Sharon, you're talking about a golfing buddy. Not anymore. You scared the hell out of me back at Gerard's when he turned that gun on you. Hey, how do you think I felt when I found out you were in there? Like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> we make a hell of a team, don't we? A hell of a team. <laughs> You've been listening to Alternate Catches, the latest installment in Paul Ledoux's series, In the Blood, the newest original offering on The Mystery Project. Featured in today's cast were Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin, Jennifer Overton as his wife Sharon, Jamie Bradley as Bruce McKenzie, Joseph Rutten as Ray Burgess, Luke Bouille as Gerard, Caitlin Calhoun as Maggie, Ken Chipley as Jacques LeBlanc, and Andrew Kilty as Chief Thompson. Music was provided by Dave Burton. The recording engineers were Pat Martin and John McCarthy. Sound effects were by Dermot Kenny and Anton Zabel. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The associate producer of In the Blood is Peggy Hemsworth. The play was produced and directed in Halifax by Bill Howell, the executive producer of The Mystery Project. I'm Bob Boving, thanking you for listening. Hi, gang. Bob Boving here to welcome you to The Mystery Project. Tonight... We're on hand for the final episode of Paul Ledoux's current series of In the Blood. Insurance investigator Marty Carlin still has some personal ghosts to lay to rest. And when a fire destroys an old Halifax landmark, the ashes and the body discovered there start a chain reaction that leads Marty to face his most dreaded secret thoughts. In the Blood. Final episode. The Other Side of the Tracks with Barry Dunn as Marty Carlin. Summer before I went to Dalhousie University, my best friend Paddy got us both jobs painting the old grain elevators. A great view of the harbor and a six-story fall if you slipped. The grain elevators are rat heaven. They spooked me. I kept saying, why don't they put some cats in here? Paddy laughed. They did, but it never worked. See, there's this kitten gets dumped down here and raised by rodents. Tarzan of the rats, right? So the kitten grows up, takes over the elevator, and any other feline comes in and ends up thumped and dumped. Because you can't beat a cat who's really a rat. <laughs> Once I hit Dal, I was adopted by the radical crowd. Among them, Billy Saunders, a would-be black panther who loved to play with guns. They were trying to stop a downtown redevelopment scheme. And I dragged Paddy into the fight. There was a bombing. Paddy got blamed. He was innocent, but he died before the trial. I've been running into Paddy's ghost ever since I got home, and... Billy Saunders killed Paddy. But I always believed it was my fault. Yeah, Carlin was... Marty, Bruce, sorry to wake you. It's okay, what's happening? The old grain elevators? There's a fire. Yeah? Now? Yeah, and we insured the place. Biggest industrial blaze in years. And Marty, they found a body. Adam Brown. 5.20 a.m. The older you get, the easier it is to get up early. I rolled out of bed, splashed some water on my face, got dressed, and drove downtown. 5.45, I pulled up in front of an old tunnel under the train tracks. A shortcut to the elevators left over from World War II. My old friend, Sergeant Denny McNeil, pulled in behind me, slurping a big mug of tea and looking like he hadn't been awake any longer than me. But true to form, he knew everything that was going on. They found the body opposite the side entrance. The subfloor had fallen away. It looks like it left him trapped. They got a ladder over the gap and pulled him out, but paramedics say cause of death looks like smoke inhalation. Which does nothing to answer the big question. 
What was a city alderman like Brown doing in an abandoned grain elevator at five o'clock in the morning? Yeah, good question. It's a long way from Mulgrave Park. Okay, get me up to speed. There's not much to tell. There's always one. Brown was it. One what? Black politician with a seat on city council. His family's been North End power brokers forever. You gotta remember that. No, I, uh... No, wait. Terry Brown's his brother, right? The police boys club, remember? Your battle for the club championship, I guess. He rearranged my face pretty good that afternoon. Best pro boxer we ever turned out. Yeah, he quit fighting eight years back or, or thereabouts. Damn. Did that thing burn? Yeah. Terry's still around. Oh, he's the alderman's executive assistant, whatever that means. Marty, Denny, over here. Denny, you know Ray Burgess? Oh, sure. Terrible news about Alderman Brown, eh? Terrible. But what would he be doing down here? Makes no sense. None. They got any idea how the fire started? Nah, still too hot. She says maybe by tonight, but I'll put my money on tomorrow more. Mm, definitely the biggest fire since I took over Metro Insurance. I told everybody the place was a hazard. It should have been pulled down when I acquired the property last year. But a few little old ladies of both sexes decided this ruin was a building of historic significance. <laughs> They've been stonewalling my building permit for ten months. All right, this is where you want to build that East Coast version of the West Edmonton Mall. The Sawwister Super Shopper is the most beautiful design for a mercantile complex this part of the world has ever seen. And it is definitely a cut above the West Edmonton Mall. I'm just saying what everybody's saying, Ray. Well, everybody is wrong. The Sawwester is the last link in a chain I've been building for 20 years. It'll anchor the whole downtown, create a successful retail flow once and for all, and bring Barrington Street back to life. If you can sell it to city council. It was sold. I had the votes. But now, the fire, Adam's death, I don't know. I want it, isn't it? That this would happen the night before the big vote? And that was that. We stuck around kicking the dirt for a while, jawed with a few of the fire guys, but a blaze that size? Everything takes time. Spent the day doing paperwork, and I knocked off early to hunt for some decent rye bread. Senator Green, Sharon's father, was coming for dinner. I was chef du jour, and I relished the chance to strut my stuff for the old guy. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to have dessert in the living room. The news is coming up. I want to see the item on the boat at City Hall. Come on, Dad. You know what happened. Sure, but I want to see how you covered it. Hey, you guys. Wait for me. Deadlocked between counselors in favor of Burgess Enterprises' development scheme and irate supporters of plans to convert the now-destroyed grain elevators into subsidized residential units. The tie was broken by the deciding vote of Mayor Thomas. His verdict? Yes, to business renewal in South End Halifax. Following the session, I had an opportunity to talk to Ray Burgess about the Southwester project. Mr. Burgess, you must be happy with today's decision. It is very gratifying to know that we can now move forward with the most exciting retail concept in Eastern Canada. Certainly. But your satisfaction over the council vote must be tempered by the death of Alderman Brown in last night's fire. Certainly, Adam's loss is a tragedy for the whole community. But I have to admit, I'm more than a little confused by his presence at the elevators. The possibility of arson has been Where's raised. Billy? What? Adam? I knew there was something arson. missing, but I couldn't figure it out. Absurd. Billy Saunders wasn't at the we fire, and he wasn't at council. Now that you mention it, a big day like today, Alderman Billy should be right at Ray's elbow. Right, making the boss home. look liberal as part of his Perhaps. job description. But I'm Alderman trying Brown to watch for you, Jerry. Prior to his afternoon's vote. Speculation is he was going to throw his support in another direction. Tragically, we'll never know what Adam wanted to talk about today. He was a man devoted to many issues and causes. And we're all missing. Thank you. So, you're the political wheeler dealer, Senator. Was Brown with them or not? I'd say the alderman wasn't going to support the deal. What makes you so sure? Subsidized housing benefits the alderman's constituency. He wouldn't trade that away without a quid pro quo. Something for the south end, something for the north end. 
That's how Adam Brown always worked. So, if Ray wasn't coming through... Poof. A multi-million dollar deal up in smoke. That's not a bad motive for murder. Okay, Ray had a motive. If you're looking for a murder suspect, there are alternatives. Like who? Well, check out the alderman's insurance records. Terry Brown is the sole beneficiary of a $900,000 policy. And Terry is carrying a massive debt. Keep going. Right, you were in T.O. when it went down. You see, after Terry retired from the ring, he started a club up on Goddard Street. The Gold Ring. And Terry said it would be the new Arrows Club. Your brother Patty used to love the Arrows Club. Yeah, I remember. But I was too young to get in. The Arrows Club was the only black bar in town, but everybody felt welcome. Yeah, but that was a long time ago. And in the Gottagen Street venue, Terry couldn't attract a mixed crowd. And without them, the demographics just didn't work. So, he lost the gold ring? Yeah. They say he and his partners, including Adam, went in the tank for close to a million. I found Terry at the Newsboys' gym. A boxing club that had been there since the 50s. Just a sweat-stained room above Northland Tavern. Terry still worked out every day and coached the kids. He wasn't overjoyed to see me. So when was the last time you talked to him, Terry? Yesterday afternoon. He said be in the office early. He called a press conference for 11. Did it have anything to do with the Southwester deal? I couldn't say. Come on. Council is split on this big controversial issue and your brother has a swing vote. You must have talked about it. I told you. He didn't say. But if your brother was supporting Burgess, then they must have had a deal, right? What makes you think that? Come on. South End Firm gets a multi-million dollar project. Black politician makes sure his constituents get... What? Fill in the blank for me. Okay. We had a Gottigan Street renewal project before council. Burgess was supposed to browbeat the mayor into it by raising half the money in the corporate sector. Not a bad deal. What happened? Same as usual. Excuses and delays. But if Adam was planning to make a move, he didn't let me know. He just said... Called a press conference, and I did. You're his executive assistant, and you've got no idea what he's doing? I don't buy it. Look, Carlin, I don't care whether you buy it or not. You should take a very personal interest in how I feel, because you're his beneficiary. And Adam's insurance will pay off your club debts for good. Plus, you walk away with plenty more in your pocket. In this kind of insurance investigation, we call that motive. Adam was my brother. And a very successful brother at that, eh? Successful enough to put you on staff with a fancy title but not give you a real job to do? How did it work, Terry? I had a job to... <laughs> ah, what's the use? You grow up knocking down anybody who gets in your face and you start to feel invincible. You know better every time someone lands one on your nose, but... So long as you win. What? Of course, I stopped really winning a long time ago. The Canadian title. Jansen wiped the ring with me and they never even offered a rematch. I should have quit then. But I was used to walking down the street and having everybody smile. Hey, Terry. How's she going, Terry? It's hard to let go. So I kept fighting. Until I battled my way to the bottom. <laughs> but, big but... I saved my purses. By the time my retina got blown, I had a good nest egg to put in the club. So, I thought I was still a winner. Guess I learned better, huh? You're talking around my question, Terry. I'm saying, okay, you're looking at a failure, and failure always made my brother nervous because more than anything else, Adam was a politician. So, he propped me up, Gave me a job with a serious sounding title and a salary that let me pay down my debts. In a funny way, I was set as long as he was alive. Maybe the insurance would get me out of debt, but the job was worth more. Now, I've got nothing. I'm a bum. When was the last time you saw him? Toppers. 7.30 last night. Okay, then. Let's start at Toppers. Toppers was a Gottigan Street institution. Best stakes in town. At least that's what we felt when we were 18, drinking on phony IDs. But even Toppers had seen better days. 
seemed like nobody wanted to go down to a bar in Gottingen anymore. Except for my old associate, Freddie Ferret. Jesus, Colin, where does the guy have the drink to stay away from you? You're off the beaten track yourself, aren't you, Freddie? Hey, I've been up a manager my whole life. You hey, must know Terry. Freddie knows everybody. You were here last night, right, Fred? What if I was? I like the steaks. And I was here with my brother, right? Yeah, I seen you. Adam and I had a steak, a few beer, and then I left, right? That's right, around 7.30. Pleasure's right was on. What happened to Adam after Terry left? The alderman stuck around most of the night. I remember seeing him going out the back way. But I don't know the time right off. Did he leave with anybody? Maybe. Do we always have to pay for information, Fred? It's tradition, Carlin. We're big on tradition down here, in case you forgot. Okay, I owe you 20. Now I remember. Billy Saunders. He came in around 8. They drank a tray of beer, and they staggered out the back door. How were they getting along? Pretty good, I'd say. Billy bought the tray. Adam Brown's office was right across the street from Topper's, in what used to be a high-end women's dress shop. And now all that was left of Halifax's second-best retail strip were a couple of hawk shops, the Sound Mart, and the Sally Ann. No doubt about it, Godigan Street needed renewal. But now the alderman with the vision was gone. We introduced ourselves to the cop guarding the front door and found Denny in the back office. He was pondering three thin stacks of file folders on a pile of paper scraps. How's it going? Well, looks like the alderman didn't believe in wasting paper or keeping an appointment book. I talked to him about it. He didn't listen. Autopsy results in yet? Yeah, high alcohol levels in his blood, but smoke inhalation still the probable cause. How you doing anyway, Terry? Staying alive. You know, there's been guys showing up at the front door all day asking for you. They want to know if you're going to run for your brother's seat. Me? <laughs> you're kidding. No, and neither were they. Hey, a glucometer. Yeah, found that in the desk. What's it for? Testing your blood. My brother was a diabetic. And one in ten Canadians are. He usually leave it in the office? Not unless he was planning to come back. I guess he never made it. So look, I've broken all these notes on Adam's desk into categories. Constituent complaints, business as usual, and council plans. There's about ten subcategories there. The biggest piles, Goddard Street Renewal and Southwester Project. As far as I can tell, we were looking at a definite no vote on that score. What makes you so sure? This itemized list of the proposals with B.S. written beside half of them. B.S.? As in bull? No. As in Billy Saunders. Sometimes everything in Halifax gets too close for comfort. Billy Saunders drove a Mercedes, but he still lived in the neighborhood. A renovated mansion on Brunswick Street. You could look right into his living room. If you walked out the back door of Topper's. I don't see why a search warrant's out of the question. We don't even have a crime under investigation. The elevator is still smoldering. We've got no definitive call on arson. And no evidence of foul play in the death of Alderman Brown. Come on, he left with Adam out the back door. You know they went to Billy's. That's not against the law, Martin. The best we can do is question him. We could, except Billy seems to have disappeared. Suspicious or what? Martin, it ever occurred to you this has more to do with your past than it does the present investigation? No. See you later. Denny was right, as usual. But I didn't want to hear what he had to say. I already had Billy tried and convicted. But it had a lot more to do with what had happened to Patty than it did a fire in a grain elevator and the death of a politician I didn't even know. All we needed was proof. And I was prepared to do just about anything to get it. We're in. Jeez, Carly. You ain't half bad at that. For a cop. Thanks, Fred. Pulling a B&E on Billy's place didn't make sense. But I knew Billy had killed my best friend. I never really bought that accidental discharge of a firearm business. Just so Billy don't come home unexpected. What are we looking for, anyway? If I knew that, I'd have been able to get a search warrant. <laughs> this is nuts. You want to bail out of this? You kidding? I wouldn't miss it for the world. Okay. I'm going to hit his computer, see what I can find. I want you to check the garbage. Check the garbage? Yeah, and then the basement. If something happened to Brown, Billy might have had some cleaning up to do. And maybe he just didn't do it too good. Take it a little deeper, my motivation read like this. I needed Billy to be a killer so I could stop feeling like Patty's death was my fault. 
Geez, Carolyn, we've been here an hour. Time to go, eh? You find something? Yeah. Billy's been writing personal checks to Alderman Brown that match up perfectly with his expense checks from Burgess Enterprises. Hey, a paper trail, right? If I can work it back from the Alderman's accounts. Gotta download this stuff. Need a disc. Okay, here we go. All nicely formatted and ready to go. So, you have any luck? Just this. The geez, the guy's extremely fastidious. Who would have figured him for a junkie? So, what do you say? Freddy found the syringe at Billy's house. The lab report said it showed insulin residue. Billy's not a diabetic. The needle proves Adam was at Billy's before he died. Maybe, but I still don't know where it's going. You know what a hypoglycemic attack is like? I've seen him knock you over once or twice. Well, the insulin in this syringe works real fast. And in a massive dose... Okay, I got you. Now put it all together for me. Burgess Welch on the Gottigan Street redevelopment deal. Billy tried to pay my brother off, but finally Adam couldn't stomach it. He called a press conference to denounce the plan. Then he calls Billy and says, back off or I'll talk about the bribes. Billy asks for a meeting at Topper's. He feeds Brown a lot of beer, invites him back to his place, pops him with insulin, Brown passes out. Then he takes him down to the elevator? He's got it all figured out. He torches the place, leaves Adam behind. Once they've established it's arson, then my brother will be discredited. It's the same M.O. Burgess who was back in 72. Somebody bombs his office, Patty gets killed, the opposition gets discredited, he wins the vote at City Hall. And the elevator's gone too. So the historical commission's plan is nothing but a pile of cinders and ash. So, do I have a case? No. You've only got a theory based on a B and E. Any good lawyers... But I'm not a cop. I'm a private citizen. So if it comes to it, the evidence is still good. <sighs> Maybe. But it doesn't matter, Murdy. Billy's dead. What? The floor in the green elevator collapsed, remember? They found Billy in the sub-basement. It was arson, all right. And maybe murder. But the killer is dead. Well, Burgess isn't dead. I've got computer records of payoffs to Brown and... If you think the chief's going to open a file on the city's most powerful developer on the basis of a stolen computer disk... This is Halifax, Martin. Remember? Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. I went home feeling like I'd been run down by a truck. I remembered every reason in the world why I'd left here in the first place. I couldn't forget it. Billy was gone with too many questions left unanswered. Too many things I needed to say and needed to hear. And Ray still out there walking around making deals. I got out the disc I'd stolen from Billy. Booted up a home computer and... The words came streaming up the screen and stopped. I scanned the list looking for the Excel files I downloaded. But there was another file with the name that made my hair stand on end. Carlin. I opened the file. It was a long, disconnected, rambling letter that began. Martin Carlin showed up at the office today. It's more than twenty years since I've seen him. He's changed. But I guess we've all changed. Except for Patty. Patty's never going to change. He's dead. And so it went, Billy sliding through time, detailed descriptions of my every move since I'd returned to Halifax, circling around that one single defining night in both of our lives. The night Patty died. After we got his son back in the boat, he actually thanked me. Like we were friends, or like... We were friends, or like maybe we could be friends. Even in Chester. He didn't see Ray winking at me over his shoulder. Patty again. It went on page after page. Intense, self-absorbed, and slowly shifting in tone as it turned into a letter written to me. Forgive me, Martin. For all of it, but mostly for Patty. Ray killed him, Marty, not me. Yeah, I bombed the office. You always thought that, but it was so much bread, man. And Burgess was going to win eventually. He had the power, the connections. We had nothing. Here's how it went down. After the bombing, 
Ray was at my place to pay me off. Suddenly, Patty's standing there. He picked the lock and he had a camera. He figured out it was me and Ray. He didn't have brains, Martin. Patty said he was taking his shots to the press. I didn't even see it coming. Ray picks up the shotgun and I always kept it loaded, man. How do you describe the moment when, when you saw your soul? I looked at Ray, the shotgun in his hands, pleading with me, and I thought I had him. All I had to do was confess, do the time, and for the rest of my life, he was mine. Not exactly how it turned out, Martin. Well, I got a job on release. I used his money, did some good, I thought. But he owned me, Martin, not the other way around. That's the way it works around here, after all. Always has. Since then, there's been a million little jobs. Then tonight, Adam Brown was a friend. We worked close for years. It was tough, honest, fair. But finally, Ray got to him, too. I hated to pay Adam off, but he hated it even worse. Nighty called and said he was bailing out. Ray was furious. Told me to get Adam back to my place. I, I did what I was told. The confession went on. Details, motivation, and finally, a clue as to why Billy was dead. He'd given me everything I needed to incriminate Ray Burgess, but... I called Burgess Enterprises and made an appointment. They, they fought. fought. Ray hit him hard enough to put him out. Then he produces the insulin and tells me his plan. We take Adam down to the elevator. Makes it look like he's had a diabetic attack while starting the fire. Just how long is this amusing little fiction? I'm busy. Just about finished. I've been sitting here for an hour looking at this damn screen. I can't go through with it. Adam is down there in the elevator now, still breathing. But when the incendiary device goes off, he dies. I can't do it again, Marty. I've got to stop it. Noble sentiments. Yeah. I guess he was a little late. Didn't he set the timer? Or was it you? <laughs> this is the most grotesque example of tastelessness I've ever encountered. I mean, how long did it take you to write that pablum anyway? An inquest won't call it pablum. Once I show them everything I've got. You've got nothing. If you did, you wouldn't be trying to rattle me with Billy's little love letter. Facts. Patty's case has been closed for more than 20 years. Billy confessed and served his time. It's over. And as far as Adam is concerned, you've botched every move you made. And your evidence is nothing but a computer disk you can't even prove you stole from Billy's home. Incidentally, Billy's computer is networked into the office. I can assure you the files you claim you downloaded don't exist. I checked. You mean you destroyed them after you found out Billy was dead? No, no. You missed my point. If they existed, I could find them. I can't find them. Therefore, they never existed. You need a rest, Marty. Why don't you turn off that stupid tape recorder you've got in your pocket and go home? It's not over, Ray. No? Well, then, let's just call this my round, shall we? You have just heard The Other Side of the Tracks, the final episode in the current series of In the Blood by Paul Ledoux. In the cast, Barry Dunn was Marty Carlin. Jamie Bradley was Bruce McKenzie. John Fulton was Danny McNeil. Joseph Rutten was Ray Burgess. Richard Serkham was Senator Green. Jennifer Overton was Sheriff. With them were Cecil Wright as Terry Brown and George Boyd as Billy Saunders. The original music was by Dave Burton. The recording engineers were Pat Martin and John McCarthy. Sound effects were by Dermot Kenny and Anton Zavel. Casting was by John Dunsworth of Filmworks and Alex Duncan. The associate producer was Peggy Hemsworth. 
The program was produced and directed in Halifax by our executive producer, Bill Howell. I'm Bob Bolding, thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. <laughs>